Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the conference. Welcome, Julián. Estimados presidentes y presidentas de parlamentos, estimado presidente del Senado, estimado vicepresidente del Parlamento Europeo, Estimado presidente de la Conferencia de las Asambleas Legislativas Regionales de Europa, estimados jefes de delegación y resto de miembros de las delegaciones parlamentarias, estimados miembros de la Fundación IDEA y de Interpares, autoridades, señoras y señores, es un placer y una alegría darles la bienvenida a todos ustedes a esta conferencia conmemorativa del Día Internacional del Parlamentarismo. Darles la bienvenida a esta bellísima ciudad de León y a este recinto histórico de la Real Colegiata de San Isidoro, auténtica cuna del parlamentarismo. Aprovecho para agradecer al Abad, don Luis, la cálida acogida. Quiero agradecer también a todos ustedes el que hayan aceptado la invitación a participar en esta conferencia con la que damos inicio a la dimensión parlamentaria de la Presidencia Española del Consejo de la Unión Europea. El número de delegaciones presentes, que representan a 20 países más el Parlamento Europeo y la Conferencia de las Asambleas Legislativas Regionales de Europa, y la representación de alto nivel de todos los participantes, es expresión del gran interés que ha suscitado esta reunión. Asimismo, en el marco de la participación de Interpares se encuentran representantes de 18 países más de todo el mundo. Esta calidad, y también, si me permiten, la cantidad de la representación y de participación, asegura que el desarrollo de la conferencia será especialmente provechoso para todos. Quiero realizar también un agradecimiento muy especial en mi nombre y en el del presidente del Senado, a nuestros homólogos presentes en la jornada de hoy. Sé que compatibilizar las obligaciones institucionales de la Presidencia con atender actos fuera de nuestros países siempre es complicado. El haberlo hecho posible merece nuestro más sentido agradecimiento. Queridos colegas, gracias por estar aquí. Como todos ustedes saben, Después de la sesión de trabajo sobre cooperación parlamentaria y desarrollo de la democracia, tendrá lugar la sesión de inauguración presidida por Su Majestad el Rey, a la que seguirá la conferencia magistral a cargo del profesor de la Universidad de Sydney, John King. Tras la pausa del almuerzo, tendrá lugar la sesión central sobre la, sobre la defensa de los valores europeos y de las instituciones democráticas frente a los nuevos retos y amenazas de la democracia. Pondrá fin a la conferencia la sesión de clausura en la que se adoptará la Declaración de León sobre parlamentarismo. Señoras y señores, antes de dar inicio a la conferencia, el alcalde de la ciudad les dirigirá unas breves palabras de bienvenida. Tiene la palabra el alcalde de León, don José Antonio Díez Díaz. Muchísimas gracias. Presidenta del Congreso, Presidente del Senado, Vicepresidente del Parlamento Europeo, Presidentes, Vicepresidentes y miembros de los Parlamentos Internacionales, Delegada del Gobierno, señorías, buenos días a todas y todos. Desde su fundación, hace más de dos mil años, la ciudad de León ha desempeñado un papel fundamental en la historia de España y de Europa, cruce de caminos y enclave esencial para el desarrollo de nuestro país y de la civilización. Urbe situada en el cruce de la Vía de la Plata y de la Ruta Jacobea, el camino de peregrinación más importante de la cultura cristiana. El Reino de León, el más extenso y prolongado de la Edad Media, fue esencial para la gestación de Europa y de la democracia actual, pese al olvido al que durante siglos se obligó a esta ciudad. Hace trece años, coincidiendo con la conmemoración del 1100 aniversario del Reino de León, Emprendimos el proyecto del reconocimiento histórico para nuestra tierra y así, hace una década, la UNESCO reconoció a nuestra ciudad y a este enclave en que nos encontramos como la cuna del parlamentarismo, 
La primera vez que un monarca, el rey Alfonso IX, convocaba a los hombres buenos, cibes, al pueblo, con voz en una cura regia. En una cura regia. De ese momento, de 1188, se conservan los de Creta, el texto considerado esencial para entender algunos derechos fundamentales y que no nacía de otra pretensión que de la de mantener la paz en el reino, que era, evidentemente, la más alta pretensión. El reconocimiento internacional de ese camino, que como río con meandros nos lleva a la democracia actual, se ratifica hoy con su presencia en este acto, esencial para nuestro legado y sobre todo para nuestro presente. De reunión y de Creta, de ese tan leonés juntarse y ayuntarse en los problemas, nacen juntas, parlamentos y ayuntamientos. León, cuna del parlamentarismo, recibe a los representantes de los más importantes parlamentos europeos en lo que sin duda es para nosotros un día histórico. Gracias por ello a todos los presentes, gracias a las Cortes Españolas que ratificaron el título de León hace ya más de una década y que hoy lo consagran internacionalmente. Bienvenidos todos y todas a la cuna del parlamentarismo, a la capital del viejo reino de León, tierra de libertades y germen de España, de los reinos que conforman nuestro país y referente de la democracia de la Europa actual. Es un auténtico honor para nosotros, pueblo de León, recibirlos hoy, parlamentos constituidos como herederos de aquellas primeras cortes leonesas en nuestra ciudad, y en este claustro donde se gestó la democracia. Muchísimas gracias a todos y bienvenidos a la Ciudad de León. What did you do? Ah, I'm a Good morning. Oh, good morning. How are you? Kevin Casas, real pleasure. Kevin Casas, real pleasure. Pleasure. Kevin Casas. Um, Thank you very much. If you, uh, if you allow me, what I was thinking is perhaps we could do the panel in alphabetical order, in alphabetical order, um, and that way allows for Mr. Caras to make the uh, the presentation of the uh, of the declaration that you want to submit to the consideration of the... You have a list, yes. Yeah. Uh, but if not, I mean, I'll do it in the order that it appears in the program. It's exactly the same for me. I mean, that way, the, the first speaker, the, the speakers of the parliaments uh, speak first, and then Mr. Caras. Is that agreeable? Is there a... That's it. 
What do you want? Or we have a, we have a yes. order. We have an order. We okay. Well, order. And then in that case, we'll do it in the in the order that is in the form. Er wollte wissen, ob wir drehen. Er wollte wissen, ob wir die, die Reihenfolge. Er wollte, die Rei er wollte wissen, ob wir die Reihenfolge umdrehen sollen. Nein, wir lassen es Apparently we have until 10 minutes before 11. Before, because people have to move to, uh, there's a picture that needs to be taken. And so, okay. Muy buenos días a todas y todos. Good morning to you all. And this is the last I'm going to say in English. Eh, aquí me voy a dar el gusto de pasar a la lengua de Cervantes, estando donde estamos. Eh, es un enorme gusto para mí estar aquí. Yo soy Kevin Casas, soy el secretario general de IDEA Internacional una organización intergubernamental con 34 estados miembros creada en 1995 con sede en Estocolmo para apoyar el avance de la democracia en todo el mundo. Para mí es un, es un enorme privilegio estar acá, eh, privilegio que empiezo por manifestar eh, agradeciendo a los organizadores de esta actividad, las diferentes entidades que han hecho eh, esta reunión posible y en particular a las Cortes Generales de España. Es además un gusto eh, para todos nosotros, pienso, pero ciertamente para mí, viniendo de donde vengo, Estar en una ciudad como León, que no solo es extraordinariamente hermosa, muy importante en la historia de la hispanidad, eh, sino que además sucede que es una de las cunas del parlamentarismo a nivel global. Eh, es apropiado que estemos teniendo esta conversación justo en esta hermosísima ciudad. El panel que empieza esta discusión tiene por título La cooperación parlamentaria y el desarrollo democrático. Y yo quisiera que para tener esta discusión partiéramos de tres premisas. La primera es una que no por obvia debe dejar de mencionarse, que es que la solidez del Parlamento es un elemento esencial en la salud de la democracia. El Parlamento encarna algunos de los elementos torales de la construcción democrática, encarna la existencia de frenos y contrapesos, encarna la posibilidad de que diversas voces participen en el debate democrático, encarna la posibilidad de que circule libremente la información antes de hacer las decisiones democráticas. Y encarna sobre todo la posibilidad de tener un debate y un disenso civilizado y dentro de vías institucionales. 
Y eso me parece que en una época de polarización como la que vivimos nunca ha sido tan necesario. La segunda premisa es que los retos que la democracia está enfrentando a escala global son retos globales también. Son retos que los vemos en todas las regiones y en todos los diferentes estadios de desarrollo democrático. Aquella cosa que decíamos antes de que los problemas de la democracia se estaban eh, eh, vistos en las democracias pobres y en las democracias jóvenes, ya eso no es cierto, y todos lo sabemos. Los problemas de la democracia son realmente globales. Y en la medida en que son globales, requieren de respuestas globales y requieren de acción colectiva. Y en la medida que requieren de acción colectiva, demandan cooperación parlamentaria y demandan interacción creativa, constructiva entre los diferentes eh, actores políticos y particularmente entre los diferentes parlamentos del mundo. Y la tercera premisa que quisiera dejar sentada es que está muy bien, es apropiado, es justo, es necesario que nos reunamos a celebrar el papel que juegan los parlamentos en la, en la democracia, pero es también menester que reconozcamos que las instituciones centrales de la democracia representativa están enfrentando una crisis muy profunda en todo el mundo. Digo, es imperativo que reconozcamos que hay un problema y que esa cooperación global que he mencionado es necesaria precisamente porque hay problemas muy profundos y no tienen que tomar lo que estoy diciendo por su valor facial. Eh, les doy un par de, un par de datos eh, que, con los que me he cruzado recientemente. En mi parte del mundo, en América Latina, yo vengo de Costa Rica, si ustedes toman los datos del latinobarómetro de la encuesta regional que se hace cada dos años en América Latina, eh, cuando se le pregunta a la gente si tiene confianza en los, en los congresos, en las legislaturas, en los parlamentos, únicamente un 20% de la gente dice que tiene confianza. Y si ustedes abren un poquito el lente y usan los datos de la encuesta eh, mundial de valores, que es una encuesta que cubre 79 países, si no me acuerdo mal, cuando le preguntan a la gente si tiene confianza en los partidos políticos, que al igual que los parlamentos son la savia de la democracia representativa, 70% de la gente dice que no tiene confianza en 79 países y únicamente un magro 4.5% de la gente dice que tiene alto nivel de confianza en los partidos políticos. Entonces hay un problema, hay un problema de la democracia representativa que es necesario atender con urgencia. Y para hablar de todo esto, para hablar de por qué es necesaria la cooperación parlamentaria para atender este conjunto de problemas peliagudos que tenemos en las manos, tenemos la buena fortuna de tener un panel estupendo y un panel de alto nivel. Tenemos eh, con nosotros, y lo voy a decir en el orden en que van a, a exponer, eh, a mi izquierda tengo al honorable Otmar Caras, eh, miembro del Parlamento Europeo de Austria desde 1999 y primer vicepresidente del Parlamento Europeo desde enero del de año 2022. Eh, él es miembro del Partido del Pueblo de Austria y es un honor y un gusto tenerlo aquí. No. 
Uh, yes, uh, now. Um, Excellencies, good morning. We, I mean, I think I can switch to my mother tongue the German. There's going to be a few interventions. Sehr geehrte Frau Präsidentin, uh, Frau Merichel Fadet, sehr geehrter Herr Präsident Ander Chill, sehr geehrte Präsidenten und Vizepräsidenten der Parlamente, Herr Bürgermeister, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Im Namen des Europäischen Parlaments und unserer Präsidentin Roberta Metzola möchte ich Ihnen sehr herzlich für die Einladung und für die Initiative danken. Am Samstag, dem 1. Juli, übernimmt Spanien EU-Ratspräsidentschaft. Nach innen wie von außen eine schwierige Herausforderung. Wir können alle nur alles Gute wünschen. Diese hochkarätige Konferenz ist ein guter Start. Herzliche Gratulation dazu. Wir haben schon gehört, 28 Vertreter verschiedener Parlamente oder Vertreter aus 28 Ländern. Nicht nur aus Europa, sondern auch aus Übersee sind heute hier an diesem historischen Platz zusammengekommen, am Internationalen Tag des Parlamentarismus, an diesem geschichtsträchtigen Ort, den die UNESCO mit Unterstützung von Professor John Keane vor zehn Jahren zur Wiege des europäischen Parlamentarismus erklärt hat. Und es ist mir eine besondere Freude, als erster Vizepräsident des Europäischen Parlaments, unser gemeinsames Projekt, die Charta zur Rolle der Parlamente in einer funktionierenden liberalen Demokratie nicht nur präsentieren, sondern mit Ihnen auch ansprechen und diskutieren zu dürfen. Ja, es geht um die liberale parlamentarische Demokratie die Grundlagen unserer Zusammenarbeit und Entscheidungsfindung, die Grundlagen des sozialen Zusammenhalts in unserer Gesellschaft, die Grundlagen der Rolle der Parlamente und der Beteiligung der Bürgerinnen und Bürger am demokratischen Prozess. Ich selbst, ich weiß nicht, wie es Ihnen geht, hätte mir vor Jahren noch nicht ahnen lassen, dass ich je einmal so definitiv und so engagiert mich für die liberale parlamentarische Demokratie einsetzen muss, weil es für mich klar war, was wir darunter meinen. Es scheint aber nicht mehr für alle klar zu sein, weil immer mehr Politiker missbrauchen die liberale Demokratie, um sie umzuwandeln in eine autoritäre, demokratisch legitimiertes Verhalten. Wir sprechen daher heute über die Stärkung der liberalen Demokratie. Es geht um eine ganz essentielle Frage, nämlich um die Kernelemente unserer Arbeit, die uns in allen Parlamenten in Europa und der Welt beschäftigt. Leon symbolisiert es. Der europäische Parlamentarismus sucht seinesgleichen. Die Europäische Union ist ein einzigartiges Projekt mit einer eigenen Geschichte, Rechtsordnung, Grundrechten, einem eigenen multinationalen Parlament, einer von diesem gewählten Regierung, einer starken Länderkammer, einem eigenen Gericht und Rechnungshof. Wir gemeinsam sind die europäische liberale Demokratie. Es ist doch wohl offensichtlich, vielleicht sind wir gerade deshalb hier, diese, unsere liberale parlamentarische Demokratie, ist unter Druck geraten, innerhalb und außerhalb der Europäischen Union, durch äußere Einwirkungen, aber auch durch innere 
Fehlentwicklungen. Einerseits haben wir externe Herausforderungen. Der Angriffskrieg Russlands gegen die Ukraine, die Covid-19-Pandemie, Teuerung, Energie- und Klimakrise, Digitalisierung und künstliche Intelligenz, ausländische Einmischung, Fake News und Desinformation, Abhängigkeiten und dadurch Erpressbarkeiten. Auf der anderen Seite, und das sollten wir nicht verschweigen, haben wir interne Faktoren, die demokratisch die Autori Autoritarisierung, ich habe sie angesprochen, mancher Akteure. Die Extremisten, Populisten und Nationalisten, welche die Polarisierung, die Schuldzuweisung, die Konfrontation und Blockade über die Suche nach gemeinsamen Lösungen stellen. Die vermeintlich einfache Antwort wird der realen Komplexität nicht gerecht. Die Verantwortungsdemokratie wird allzu oft von der Stimmungsdemokratie bedroht. Recht wird gebrochen. Werte werden verletzt. Vertrauen geht verloren. Meinungsfreiheit wird beschnitten. Parlamente werden mit Notverordnungsrechten mundtot gemacht. Die Unabhängigkeit der Justiz und Gewaltentrennung wird eingeschränkt. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich denke, wir sind uns alle einig. Wir können Frieden, Freiheit, Demokratie nicht als selbstverständlich erachten. Der ethische, moralische Fortschritt der letzten Jahrzehnte ist kein Naturgesetz. Das, was von einer Generation errungen wurde, kann von der nächsten wieder verloren werden. Manchmal habe ich das Gefühl, wir sind am besten weg dazu. Wir müssen daher alles tun, um diese unsere Errungenschaften zu stärken. Das ist nach Immanuel Kant eine gemeinsame Aufgabe und Verantwortung, die weder mit dem Tod noch dem Rücktritt eines Politikers aufhört der alle Menschen guten Willens verpflichtet sind und die wir täglich wiedergewinnen und neu erringen müssen. Damit wir die Parlamente, die liberale parlamentarische Demokratie erhalten, stärken, weiterentwickeln und erneuern können, selbstbewusst und erfolgreich innerhalb und außerhalb der Europäischen Union, benötigen wir aus meiner Sicht vor allem zweierlei. Erstens. Erstens ein gemeinsames Verständnis, wovon wir sprechen und was wir gemeinsam wollen. Zweitens den politischen Willen, dieses Wollen und dieses Bekenntnis täglich um- und durchzusetzen. Die Initiative zu einer gemeinsamen Entwicklung einer Charta zur Rolle der Parlamente in einer funktionierenden liberalen Demokratie vereint beide Ziele. Alle Sprecher der Parlamente der EU haben das Projekt am 24. und 25. April in Prag begrüßt. Nach dem Kick-off auf dieser Konferenz wollen wir es gemeinsam weiterentwickeln. Ich lade Sie alle ein, mitzuarbeiten. Und noch vor den nächsten EU-Wahlen bei der Konferenz der Sprecher der Parlamente der Europäischen Union am 21. bis 23. April 2024 in Madrid wollen wir diese unsere erarbeitete Charta gemeinsam annehmen. Was sollte diese Charta umfassen? Aus meiner Sicht das gemeinsame Verständnis die Grundprinzipien und die Kernelemente des modernen Parlamentarismus. 
Wer sind wir eigentlich, die Parlamente der Europäischen Union? Warum gibt es keine liberale Demokratie ohne uns? Was ist unsere Rolle heute? Und was wollen wir eigentlich bewahren oder erneuern und in die Zukunft tragen? Ich möchte sieben Grundprinzipien nennen. Erstens, das Grundverständnis der Parlamente als Herzstück der liberalen Demokratie. Wir müssen außer Streit stellen, dass sich die europäische Demokratie nur dann bewähren kann, wenn der Parlamentarismus funktioniert. Denn als direkt gewählte Kammern der Bürgerinnen und Bürger sind die Parlamente das Herzstück der Demokratie. Wir repräsentieren den Souverän. Zweitens, die Bedeutung der Parlamente für die Gewaltentrennung. Wir sorgen für Transparenz, Kontrolle, sind Gesetzgeber und schützen Minderheiten und suchen nach einer gemeinsamen, mehrheitsfähigen Lösung. Die Gewaltentrennung zwischen Legislative, Exekutive und Judikative muss gelebt werden, unabhängig und in Relation zueinander. Diese Gewaltentrennung ist derzeit nicht überall vollumfänglich gewährleistet. Die Gewaltentrennung wird immer mehr zu einem Thema von Mehrheit und Minderheit und nicht zu einer Gewaltentrennung zwischen den Institutionen. Damit geht Vertrauen in sie verloren. Wir erleben einen Wandel von der parlamentarischen zur Regierungsdemokratie. Das schwächt die Parlamente, den gesellschaftlichen und politischen Pluralismus. Drittens, die Aufgaben, Befugnisse und Beteiligung der Parlamente in der demokratischen Entscheidungsfindung. Die Parlamente müssen das letzte Wort im demokratischen Prozess haben, weil die Bürgerinnen und Bürger das letzte Wort haben müssen. Regierungen sind den Parlamenten verantwortlich nicht Parlamente den Regierungen verpflichtet. Parlamentarismus heißt Kompromiss, nicht Automatismus. Dazu gehören die Aufgaben, Gesetzgebung, Kontrolle und Haushalt, die Beseitigung der Einstimmigkeit, des Einstimmigkeitsprinzips, das die Parlamente schwächt auf europäischer Ebene. Doppelte Mehrheitsentscheidungen der Staaten und der Bürgerinnen und Bürger. Viertens, das Bekenntnis der Parlamente zur klaren Aufgabenteilung. Wir dürfen die vier Ebenen der europäischen Demokratie, Gemeinde, Land, Nation, Europa, nicht durcheinander bringen und vor allem nicht gegeneinander ausspielen. Politische Entscheidungen sollen bürgernah, transparent, effizient und lösungsorientiert auf jener Ebene getroffen werden, wo auch die Verantwortung für diese Maßnahmen liegt. Fünftens, das Bekenntnis der Parlamente zur repräsentativen Demokratie. Jeder von uns als Parlamentarier ist eigenverantwortlich und nicht fremdbestimmt. Machen wir uns aber auch nicht fremdbestimmt. Mechanismen der partizipativen und direkten Demokratie können nützlich sein, aber sie können und dürfen die repräsentative Demokratie nicht ersetzen. Repräsentative Demokratie heißt nicht Ja-Nein-Demokratie, nicht Schwarz-Weiß-Demokratie, nicht Entweder-Oder-Demokratie, sondern die Suche nach einem tragfähigen demokratischen Kompromiss. Meine Damen und Herren, ich komme damit zum Schluss. Sechstens, das Bekenntnis der Parlamente zu, Präsen zu Präsenzparlamenten, ich sage das gerade nach Covid-19. 
im Sinne des lateinischen Ballare erfordert die liberale Demokratie ein Präsenzparlament. Digitalisierung und Pandemie haben zur digitalen Transformation der Parlamente beigetragen. Aber das darf die Abstimmungen, Debatten und Verhandlungen in Präsenz nicht ersetzen, vor allem nicht im legislativen Bereich. Digitale Möglichkeiten haben gleichzeitig das Potenzial, das politische Verständnis zwischen den Parlamenten zu verbessern. Sie können Kommunikation, Information und Bewusstsein stärken und die Verkehrs- und Reisemissionen verringern, den Kontakt zu den Bürgerinnen und Bürgern stärken. Siebtens, die Widerstandsfähigkeit der Parlamente gegenüber ausländischer Einmischung, Desinformation und Falschnachrichten. Faktenbasierte Information, Debatten und Entscheidungen sind unabdingbar für die liberale Demokratie. Wir brauchen gemeinsame Standards, um den demokratischen Diskurs und Entscheidungsfindungsprozess vor ausländischer Einmischung, Desinformation und Falschnachrichten zu schützen, besonders in Zeiten von Digitalisierung, Social Media und künstlicher Intelligenz. Wir Parlamente und Abgeordnete brauchen wissenschaftliche Dienste und eine angemessene Ausstattung, um unabhängig eigenverantwortlich agieren zu können. Wir benötigen Transparenzregeln und ein Transparenzregister für all jene, die auf uns Einfluss nehmen wollen. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, wann, wenn nicht jetzt, in Zeiten so vielfältiger Herausforderungen, mitten in einer Auseinandersetzung der Systeme, der Bedrohungen von außen und von innen und einem wachsenden Vertrauensverlust der Bürgerinnen und Bürger in politische Institutionen, Parteien und Akteure, gilt es, unsere Zusammenarbeit zu vertiefen. Gilt es, selbstbewusst, argumentierend, begründend für die liberale parlamentarische Demokratie und unsere Arbeit öffentlich einzutreten. Fürchten wir uns nicht, zu dem zu stehen, was uns ausmacht. Gehen wir nicht vor jeder Kritik in die Knie, sondern suchen wir die öffentliche Auseinandersetzung. Wir müssen die liberale parlamentarische Demokratie stärken und die Bürgerinnen und Bürger ermutigen, bei allen Wahlen ihre Parlamente zu wählen. Die Zusammensetzung der Parlamente entscheidet über die Richtung, welche Politik gemacht wird. Ich bin davon überzeugt, ja, wir können es schaffen, aber nur gemeinsam. Vielen Dank. Muchas gracias al señor Caras. Me toca ahora el, el honor de introducir a la siguiente ponente, que es la honorable Berbel Bass, presidenta del de Bundestag de Alemania desde el año 2021 y miembro del Partido Socialdemócrata Alemán desde mucho antes de eso y además alguien, debo decirlo, que ha jugado un papel muy importante en el apoyo por parte de Alemania a la causa justa de Ucrania dentro de Alemania y dentro del G7. Presidenta Bas, la palabra es suya. Exzellenz, sehr geehrte Frau Präsidentin, 
Exzellenz, sehr geehrter Herr Senatspräsident, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, vielen Dank für die Einladung zu dieser wirklich besonderen Konferenz am Vorabend der spanischen EU-Ratspräsidentschaft. Ich wünsche Spanien viel Erfolg. Ihre Präsidentschaft fällt in wirklich eine entscheidende Zeit. Ich freue mich sehr, hier in Leon zu sein, laut UNESCO der Geburtsort des Parlamentarismus. Vielen Dank, Herr Vizepräsident Karas, auch für Ihren Beitrag. Sehr geehrte Kolleginnen und Kollegen, überall auf der Welt werden unsere Demokratien herausgefordert, auch in Europa. Von innen durch Populismus und Polaris Polarisierung und von außen durch autoritäre Mächte, zum Teil mit brutaler Gewalt. Der russische Krieg gegen die Ukraine ist auch ein Angriff auf die Demokratie und ihre Werte. Zugleich sehen sich Demokratien hybriden Bedrohungen gegenüber. Autoritäre Mächte infiltrieren unsere Gesellschaften. Mit Hilfe digitaler Technologien verbreiten sie Propaganda und Desinformation. Die Autokratien modernisieren sich. Sie verbünden sich, um die bestehende Ordnung zu untergraben. Darauf kann es nur eine Antwort geben. Auch wir Demokratinnen und Demokraten müssen enger zusammenarbeiten. Noch stärker, als wir es bisher schon tun. Die internationale Demokratieförderung ist traditionell eine Aufgabe der Exekutive. Doch Regierungen setzen dabei andere Prioritäten als Parlamente. Darum müssen auch wir Parlamentarierinnen und Parlamentarier uns zusammentun, um die Demokratie zu verteidigen, überall auf der Welt. Wir müssen uns gegenseitig stärken und voneinander lernen und deutlich machen, parlamentarische Verfahren sind der Kern einer liberalen Demokratie. In unseren Parlamenten kommen verschiedene Positionen zur Sprache und werden zu notwendigen Kompromissen weiterentwickelt. Erst Parlamentarismus ermöglicht Pluralismus, sichert die Rechte der Opposition und setzt autoritären Versuchungen klare Grenzen. Die Zusammenarbeit der Parlamente stärkt die Demokratien gegen ihre Feinde. Nehmen wir also unsere Zusammenarbeit ernst und stellen wir die nötigen Ressourcen bereit. Sie sind eine wichtige Investition in unsere demokratische Zukunft. Sehr geehrter Herr Kassas, bei dieser Gelegenheit danke ich auch Ihnen und Ihren Kolleginnen und Kollegen von Interpares für die Organisation von Parlamentspatenschaften. Wir im Deutschen Bundestag sehen deutlich den Mehrwert, den das Programm zur Förderung der Demokratie leistet. Zudem hilft uns der Austausch, unsere eigenen Verfahren kritisch zu reflektieren. Sehr geehrte Kolleginnen und Kollegen, aus der Erfahrung des Nationalsozialismus haben wir Deutschen gelernt. Eine Demokratie muss sich gegen ihre Feinde schützen. Wir orientieren uns seitdem am Konzept der sogenannten wehrhaften Demokratie. Lassen Sie uns gemeinsam das Konzept der wehrhaften Demokratie weiterentwickeln für eine Zeit der hybriden Bedrohung und des digitalen Autoritarismus. Erstens, wir müssen die Resilienz unserer Gesellschaften stärken und unserer Parlamente. Ich sage bei dieser Gelegenheit ausdrücklich, der Deutsche Bundestag kann von anderen lernen, insbesondere beim Umgang mit digitaler Desinformation oder der Abwehr von Cyberangriffen müssen wir in Deutschland noch besser werden. Zweitens, wir brauchen strengere Regulierung im Sinne der wehrhaften Demokratie. Wir müssen die Betreiber von Messengern und digitalen Plattformen in die Pflicht nehmen. In der Europäischen Union haben wir schon Erfolge erzielt, aber auch hier können wir noch besser werden. Die weitere Entwicklung von künstlicher Intelligenz lässt sich auch noch nicht absehen. Doch jetzt ist klar, KI 
lässt sich auch zur Destabilisierung anderer Staaten missbrauchen. Ein gemeinsames Vorgehen der Demokratien ist deshalb dringend nötig. Und ich freue mich, dass das Europäische Parlament vorangeht und einen ehrgeizigen Entwurf für das weltweit erste KI-Gesetz verabschiedet hat. Sehr geehrte Kolleginnen und Kollegen, es muss uns zu denken geben, dass auch in stabilen Demokratien viele Menschen unzufrieden sind. Autoritäre Systeme nutzen diese Unzufriedenheit manipulativ für ihre Zwecke. Wehrhaft ist eine Demokratie nur, wenn sie ihre Bürgerinnen und Bürger aktiv beteiligt. Im Bundestag sammeln wir Erfahrungen mit deliberativen Verfahren der Bürger. Beteiligung. Der Bundestag hat im Mai den ersten Bürgerrat dieser Wahlperiode eingesetzt. 160 per Zufall bestimmte Personen werden sich ab September umfangreich mit einem Thema beschäftigen. Anschließend legt dieser Bürgerrat dem Bundestag Empfehlungen vor. Für mich hat dieses Instrument viel Potenzial, um auch unsere parlamentarische Demokratie sinnvoll zu ergänzen. Bei aller notwendigen Selbstkritik vergessen wir unsere Stärken nicht. Demokratien sind leistungsfähiger, weil sie lernfähig sind und weil sie nicht nur Zweckallianzen bilden, sondern eine echte, zu einer echten Zusammenarbeit fähig sind. Sehr geehrte Kolleginnen und Kollegen, auch diese Konferenz zeugt von der Solidarität von Demokratien. Ich bin gespannt auf Ihre Erfahrungen auf ihre Erwartungen an unsere Zusammenarbeit. Mit dieser Konferenz senden wir am heutigen Tag des Parlamentarismus ein starkes Signal der Geschlossenheit aus. Vielen Dank. Muchas gracias a la presidenta Bas. Debo decir además que agradezco mucho la amable mención al trabajo que hacen mis colegas de, de Interpares. En efecto, el Bundestag ha sido un, eh, un apoyo permanente al trabajo de, de Interpares y debo decir, además, que Alemania es un Estado miembro de IDEA Internacional, cosa que a mí me llena de orgullo. Así que muchas gracias por eso. Le paso ahora la palabra y tengo el honor de introducir a la honorable Marqueta Pejarova Adamova, la presidenta de la Cámara de Diputados de la República Checa desde el año 2021 y además líder del partido Top 09. Eh, es un gusto tenerla aquí y por favor, el podio es suyo, presidenta. <laughs> Madam Speaker, dear Marichal, dear Speaker of the Senate, speakers and members of Parliament, dear colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, the upcoming Spanish Presidency of the EU Council for hosting this important and timely event. I'm really delighted that I can speak here today in León, one of the cradles of the European parliamentary democracy. But the role of Spain in the struggle for the political rights and representation has not ended in the 20th century. There are many other inspiring chapters in the history of your country. At the end of the 19th 70s, the successful transition to democracy, la transición española, became a pivotal part of a large democratization wave. Only a decade later, this wave reached the central and eastern Europe, and those that had been suffering under the communist oppression finally achieved their democratic aspirations. 
Why this is important to remind? Back in the time, more than 30 years ago, almost no one would question the fact that parliamentary democracy is the best political system ever invented, the most viable, the most adaptable to change, the most competitive. But what is even more important, it is by far the most representative and the fairest political system. Later on, however, many started challenging these claims. There have emerged powers that tried to foolishly convince the global public that a combination of the ruthless capitalism and dictatorship is more attractive and alternative to parliamentary democracy and market economy. Even more dangerous, though, were those in our own countries who started challenging the democratic system from within, recklessly pursuing their own selfish goals while at the same time enjoying the freedoms and rights which, ironically, only democratic system can offer. This trend accelerated with the unprecedented events of the last several years. First, the COVID-19 pandemic and the later on, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. A fertile ground has emerged for radical populist and anti-democratic forces. Forces that do not hesitate to abuse the legitimate grievances of our societies. This perilous trend must be reversed and all political institutions and players have to face it together. It is a natural part of the democratic process after all. As our keynote speaker, Mr. Keane, rightly put it, democracy is not something accomplished and has to be constantly protected and improved. However, it is the situation of Parliament that requires special attention. These core institutions of our political system are in a particularly difficult position. It is a fact that the approval rate of parliaments has been low for some time. This was mentioned before, it's over the whole world the same. Much lower than the approval rate of the executive or judicial powers. It is partly understandable because our assemblies are often scenes of passionate political conflicts. What is new, though, is the deliberate effort to paralyze the works of parliaments and to undermine its legitimacy. Therefore, we must start taking this seriously and actively come to the defense of the institutions that are the cornerstone of the democratic systems. Maybe it will be necessary to remind ourselves and our citizens of the importance of parliament, uh, parliament democracy. From the evidence-based perspective, the history teaches us that a parliamentary system of government is more conducive institutional setting for fostering democracy than other settings, presidential or semi-presidential systems. A parliament bring, brings together more political and societal groups that poses their genuine legitimacy. The main tool of parliamentary work is a debate that is also the underlying principle of any democratic regime. Parliaments may de-escalate social clashes through its internal working procedures. Parliaments are also the supreme political institution with a direct link to voters and citizens. Their role is to act for the sake of citizens. The more open parliament is, the more citizens feeling the representativeness of political system. In practical terms, 
we should focus on several priorities which could help enhance the credibility and leadership role of parliaments. Let me briefly mention some of them. First, parliaments should be forward-looking. Instead of just reacting to development, parliaments will have to work on setting the agenda and serve as a platform in which strategic political debate on future direction of our societies take place. Second, parliaments need adequate capacities. They need a structured, comprehensive, well-organized and holistic approach to enhance their role and functions in modern democratic states. Already in 1928, when he was speaking of the crisis of parliamentarism, the first Czechoslovak president, Tomáš Garik Masaryk, stressed the need of institutional capacities. He emphasized that parliaments absolutely need the expert knowledge and urged parliaments and bureaucracy to work hard in ha hand in hand instead of competing. Third, the parliaments need to cooperate at international level. Given that we all face analogical challenges and problems, we should step up our cooperation. There is a clear need of a robust parliamentary diplomacy. Lastly, an issue that is definitely not the last least important. As a woman speaker, I cannot ignore the issue of women in politics. Women are still not adequately represented, represented in top political positions. Those who are in the top positions are very often subject to repulsive personal attacks. Attacks that explicitly or implicitly target our gender. I know very well what I am talking about. The project of parliamentary democracy cannot be completed without the proper representation of women. This issue also has to be addressed in close cooperation among parliaments. Let me conclude by inviting you all to an important event of the parliamentary diplomacy. On October 24th, Prague will host the second year of the parliamentary summit of the Crimea platform. Last October, our Ukrainian and Croatian colleagues hosted the successful first year in Zagreb. I'm very happy that we have agreed with uh, Vrchovna Rada, the Ukrainian parliament, and its chairman, Stefanchuk, that this year, this event, will be hosted in Prague. The Crimean platform focuses on the Crimean Peninsula and the fact that it is illegally occupied in a clear breach of in the international law. The platform also has a global dimension and it underpins the very basic principles of our current rules-based order. I look forward to meet you all in Prague in October. And let me use this opportunity to thank our Swedish colleagues for a wonderful and successful presidency they are just finishing, and to wish our Spanish colleagues to have as well a very important but very successful presidency of the EU. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias a la presidenta Adamova. Eh, debo decir también que el Parlamento de la República Checa es otro de los que activamente ha apoyado el trabajo que estamos haciendo a través de, de Interpares y eso lo agradezco particularmente. Eh, ahora tengo el gusto de darle la palabra a la honorable Catherine Gotani Jara, quien es la presidenta de la Asamblea Nacional de Malawi desde el año 2019, miembro del Partido del Congreso de Malawi y muy importante, la primera mujer que ha presidido la Asamblea Nacional de Malawi. Eh, señora Presidenta, el podio es suyo. Es un gusto tenerla aquí. Uh, 
uh, speakers from both houses from Spain, the mayor uh, of the city of Lyon, uh, the secretary general, and my colleagues, uh, speakers uh, present here, and all honorables present. First, let me thank the Spanish government for the warm welcome that you've given us, and also for the organizers for inviting Malawi uh, specifically to be uh, uh, present at this very, very critical and important uh, meeting. Thank you very much for considering and inviting us as Malawi. I am going to talk about the um, <clears throat> inter -Pare partnership project um, at the beginning because as Malawi, we are one of the uh, beneficiaries. Uh, we have this project uh, together with our friends in the Czech uh, parliament which uh, Interpale is funding. And I think this just proves and shows the importance of parliamentary uh, diplomacy because this project is getting people from Parliament of Malawi, especially those that work in Parliament, to interact and work together with their colleagues from the Czech uh, Parliament. As you know, we say garbage in, garbage out. Meaning, as Parliament, we've actually prioritized ensuring that our members of staff are very well equipped. If we want to get best performing members of Parliament, we need our members of staff to be at their best. So we've concentrated on ensuring that we capacitate our members of staff through this project. And in that way, they support the members of Parliament in order for them to do their constitutional right, uh, which is oversight, legislative, and representation. And uh, this has worked very, very well, and we're very grateful to the, our colleagues who have given us that support and uh, EU for the support that you've given us. As you know, members of Parliament, when they come to Parliament, they're coming from various backgrounds. And that means it's not that easy for them to do some of their roles effectively if they don't get good support. For example, we have people who are nurses, but yet they're in the public appointments committee, which is supposed to be scrutinized accounts for the government. And if you can't give them that support, then you're not going to get the best in terms of scrutiny from them. And that's why we feel supporting these uh, members of staff helps to uh, capacitate our members of parliament because they're coming from various backgrounds, but you want the members of parliament to scrutinize, to do their legislative responsibi responsibility uh, properly. And uh, because of this, we now have a budget office in the parliament of Malawi, which has been supported from the same program, because before we did not have a budget office. I know so many of your parliaments who have specific budget offices that are there to scrutinize the budget, because that's probably one of the very critical roles that we play, and that's scrutinizing budgets from the executive arm of government. And we felt that is a very critical area which needed support in order for us to give uh, government the proper scrutiny uh, that it needs. And I just wanted to say that on this, it becomes a problem in a constrained, resource-constrained country like Malawi, where you have the executive arm of government di detecting how much, as a government, they'll give uh, different sectors and making it very difficult for us as members of parliament to actually do the proper scrutiny. For example, if my members of parliament were to decide to say that we think health is number one priority, the chances that they change the budgets is almost close to zero because the government would have already put in the ceilings and in real sense, sometimes parliamentarians feel like all they're doing is rubber stamping what is the executive arm of government has already presented. But the catch word they use is uh, we are resource constrained. So that on its own brings in quite a lot of challenges. And as I've said, members of parliament coming from very, very various backgrounds versus the executive arm of government who have the expertise, qualified accountants, for them to match with my members of parliament becomes a problem because we are not accountants, and yet you're expected to scrutinize this very important document from the government. And that's why this support for us is very, very critical. And I would encourage as many uh, parliaments as I can to actually support us in work like this, individually or indeed as, 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 um, as through EU. 
Because we want de democracy to thrive in our country. And democracy can only thrive if we are able to do what the people that we represent tell us to do. But it becomes a challenge when we can't do it because of the resource constraints. And that is what is used for us not sometimes to do our role and our job properly. So the support that can be given to parliaments like Malawi, which I'm sure uh, for those that have read about Malawi, it's one country which is very resource constrained. And therefore, sometimes our democracy is, uh, 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 is disturbed because of the resource constraint that we have. So this project particularly is very, very important. And I would like to encourage uh, us to do even more in order to get even our own honorable members of parliament to come and see you during your uh, debates, during your budget scrutiny, how this is done in order for us to uh, actually enhance and promote uh, democracy. I just also wanted to talk about the um, issues, global issues that we have, how those affect countries like Malawi. Somebody might say Malawi is so far away from here, so far away from Ukraine, so far away, and yet we're probably one of the countries that is hit most by whatever is happening globally. For example, I'll take the issue of fertilizer. Malawi does not produce fertilizer. We rely on other countries. And Malawi is a country that has people who go on a day on a, an empty stomach. Now, we have a challenge where cost of living is gone up so high, Cost of fertilizer has gone so high because of the conflict. At the end of the day, instead of us having one million people starving, we end up having two million people who cannot eat at the end of the day because of conflict somewhere. And that's why we feel that parliamentary, uh, parliamentarism and democracy is very, very important because for those of us that already have a lot of challenges, this is proving to be even more and more challenges. And that is coming after we had gone through uh, problems to do with COVID. And before we had recovered from the COVID, then we've had these other challenges. I think it's time that as a world, we need to look at the countries that already had issues and problems, resource constraint, and now these challenges, it means double tragedy for countries like Malawi. And then for, um, us as members of parliament, when we're doing our oversight roles, representation roles, it becomes even more of a challenge because we used to have quite a number of development partners, be it the EU, individual, bilateral, multilateral, obviously because of the challenges you're facing. We're getting quite a number of countries saying we can't continue supporting anymore because we are also going through economic challenges. That is even more uh, damaging for a country like Malawi because we can't get the extra resource that we would get. And what that means is the members of parliament themselves are now constrained in terms of what they can do for their country. In, in areas where, for example, health and agriculture, where we would get uh, countries supporting us, they've now probably reduced their support to Malawi. And as members of parliament, the little resource that is coming from the envelope of government is what we have to distribute. Sometimes not because that's the best way of distributing it, but obviously we are politicians and we end up going for what is the most popular. Populism becomes uh, the most uh, um, used factor instead of looking at what are the real priorities. So these conflicts are also bringing in that challenge in a sense that we've been uh, hit because the resource envelope is becoming smaller and smaller. And organizations like EU and so many other multilateral organizations uh, actually do give countries like Malawi aid at the same time we also do get loans. And there are times that these loans will come through parliament for scrutiny. Parliament needs to approve whether the government can get a loan from uh, EU, for example. As uh, the executive arm of government, the priority is to get a loan now because that's going to solve an immediate problem. For parliament, we scrutinize because we're feeling these loans that we're getting as a government. What do they mean for future generation? Are they sustainable? Can we continue at that path? But because you get the um, executive arm of government to say, we need this, sometimes we compromise 
our oversight role because we don't want to look like we're the ones that are blocking development. But at the end of the day, in terms of scrutiny, we're supposed to look at, is this sustainable? Can we continue in that path? Can we get more loans, get more loans as a government? But when it comes to uh, us as members of parliament, that's a time that we have to show and prove that uh, we there representing the, the people. At the same time, we don't want to be perceived as blocking development, because that's how the executive arm of government sometimes will come out and say, okay, parliament doesn't want us to get this loan. They are blocking development. It's not blocking development, but probably you're looking at the sustainability of, of, of issues. So there are those conflicts that come in between the executive and the, um, and, and, and the legislature in terms of what is a priority. We are the people's representative. But of course, you have to remember as well that we get into power in politics through uh, party politics. And at times, as a politician and belonging to political parties, you feel the right way to go is A. But because you belong to political parties, and I think it was mentioned earlier, you're talking of uh, the majority rules, Sometimes you end up moving with a majority, yes, because that's the right way to go in majority. But is that the practical way to go? I think these are questions that are very fundamental and that we need to be asking ourselves as uh, members of uh, parliament. I also just wanted to say that it was mentioned about separation of powers. For the first time in Malawi, I think about two weeks ago, we had a conference on separation of powers for the first time in our country. Because we felt that there are times that one arm of government feels they're much more powerful than the other. And in many cases, it's the executive, because they control the purse. In Malawi, we don't really determine what our budget as parliament should be. And obviously, the areas that are cut are usually the ones that the executive arm of government feels it is pushing more on them. For example, the oversight, if we want to do public hearings, those are the areas that are hardly ever funded, because obviously that's where you're going to unearth what happens in the executive arm of government. And the judiciary as well, there are times they feel that the uh, funding they get is not what they want. The executive is at liberty to decide how much we get as the other branches of government. And the times that the um, legislature, the, the judiciary also feels as parliament we step on their toes and we felt having this meeting was going to bring us together to iron out issues that uh, we feel need to be ironed out. For example, we're discussing to say maybe as parliament and as a judiciary we should be getting a certain percentage of the national budget for us not to be going with a begging ball to government as and when we need to do activity. Because that way, that is going to give us more independence and is going to help us to do our role as parliamentarians uh, much, much better. Um, and that has helped us because it's shaping the way in terms of how we should look at ourselves. So we are not in competition with each other. We are all supposed to help in terms of development, but everybody know, needs to know where their limits are. We have had sometimes uh, court cases that have been determined that we feel are infringing on the rights of parliament. For example, the times that as a speaker, the speaker was supposed to declare certain members of parliament uh, their seats vacant, that was some five, seven years ago. And what the courts did was to pull out an injunction on the speaker to say you can't make a determination. And I think that is standing up to date seven or eight years, meaning the speaker couldn't make a decision because uh, the um, judiciary had decided to put an injunction. Now, those are the issues that we're discussing. Yes, the courts are there for relief, but I think it's supposed to be temporary relief and let the speaker make a determination. Once the determination is made, then the courts can take up to, to see if the judgments were fair or not. So those are the issues that we're discussing. And as a country, we think we're advancing. But I thought it is very, very important for us to actually uh, continue pushing for uh, parliamentary diplomacy. Just this morning, I had a meeting with a Slovenian uh, speaker.
in the course of discussing, because as we're saying, the parliamentary diplomacy, it's much easier, the less hurdles. We're able to discuss issues that are for the benefit of my country, because as members of parliament, we have a less uh, uh, bureaucracy than our colleagues in the executive. So parliamentary democracy, I think it's something that we need to use complimenting our colleagues in the executive because that's much easier, it's got less fellows, and I think we understand each other as parliamentarians much, much better, and we can actually drive uh, an agenda for our country as well. For example, the issues that I've discussed with my colleague speaker from uh, Slovenia, it's now I to push with my colleagues in the executive to make sure those are taken on board. So I think parliamentary democracy is very, very important, and I would like to thank you once again for listening to us, and thank you once again for inviting a country at, at Malawi to participate in such an important forum. And I think the need for us to look at what is happening globally cannot be overemphasized looking at the times that we're going through now. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, señora presidenta, y debo decir que nada me satisface más que saber que el trabajo que está haciendo Interpares es apreciado por eh, quienes de alguna manera se están beneficiando de esta maravillosa oportunidad de establecer intercambios entre parlamentos. Eh, we all want democracy in Malawi to thrive, Madam Speaker, and we are here to support your work. So, a ver, eh, podría ponerme a hacer un resumen de todo lo que se ha dicho, no lo voy a hacer porque en primer lugar las presentaciones que se han hecho aquí han sido suficientemente claras y elocuentes, así que no hace falta que yo las resuma y además tenemos una realidad eh, muy práctica que tenemos que eh, resolver todos juntos, que es que faltando cinco minutos para las once, tenemos un plazo fatal para que termine este panel porque el grupo tiene que moverse a otro lado que no entendí bien, los organizadores nos tienen que decir para tomar la foto y eso está relacionado con el hecho de que su majestad, el rey Felipe, va a estar con nosotros más tarde, entonces los tiempos son muy ajustados. Y resulta que en estos exactamente 20 minutos que tenemos, eh, tenemos ocho personas que han solicitado la palabra. Entonces, miren, yo he hecho muchas cosas o algunas cosas difíciles en mi vida, pero no creo que haya ninguna más difícil que tratar de limitar el uso de la palabra a parlamentarios como ustedes. Eh, pero no me queda más que ser implacable en el eh, en la moderación del, del uso de la palabra en estos 20 minutos que nos quedan. Entonces, les voy a solicitar de manera encarecida a quienes tomen la palabra que no la eh, utilicen más de dos minutos. Eh, y no me quedará más que recordarles a los dos minutos que debo cederle la palabra a, a quien sigue en la lista de, de oradores y oradoras. Eh, así que, con esas reglas de juego, quisiera eh, pasarle la palabra a la honorable doctora Marta Matray, eh, vicepresidenta de la Asamblea Nacional de Hungría. Y de veras, les ruego me disculpen el ejercicio implacable eh, de mis ingratas responsabilidades como moderador de esta, de esta discusión. Eh, doctora Matray, la palabra es suya. Bueno, ya me están haciendo la cosa más fácil. Ah, ahí está, allá. Si le pueden hacer llegar un, un micrófono a la doctora Matray. Doctora, si quiere, le, si quiere le, pas, le paso la palabra al siguiente orador y después vuelvo a usted, si les parece, mientras le resuelven el problema del micrófono. Eh, vamos a pasar a la, a la siguiente 
a la siguiente solicitud de palabra y después volvemos a la doctora Matray. Están funcionando los micrófonos del todo. Vamos con el siguiente orador. Ok. Entonces, va... no, ya llegó el, el micrófono. A ver si le pasan el micrófono a la señora Matre. Az országgyűlés, a Magyarországgyűlés azért tartok különösen hasznosak, és érdekes a parlamentek szerinti jó gyakorlatokat a mert ez mindenképpen a parlamentián A demokrácia fejlesztés fontos elemei a hazani kormány. Európai Uniós parlamenti kapatírás fejlesztési programok kevélyes, hogy ezekre akár parlamenti vidék vagy technikai programok. Matray, eh, le pido amablemente que, 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 que vaya terminando su intervención. a mai eseményem. Köszönöm a megtisztelő figyelmet, elnök úr. Muchas gracias, doctora Matray. E, le paso ahora la palabra al honorable Mr. David Agius, vicepresidente de la Cámara de Representantes de Malta. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, and uh, please, Mr. Vice President Karas, give our best regards to the President Roberta Metzola, President of the European Union Excellencies, Honorable Speakers, colleagues. First of all, excellent work carried out by the Swedish Presidency of the Council of the European Union, and we thank also the Presidency now of Spain, of Spain 
And we thank you all also for taking the opportunity to commemorate the International Day of Parliamentarism by inviting us to share our experience and insights on such a momentous occasion. Obviously, as the Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw famously said, democracy is a device that ensures that we shall be governed no better than we deserve. This is a simple but strong statement, meaning that the effectiveness of parliaments depends on us elected representatives. Two years ago, the Maltese Parliament celebrated 100 years, the achievement of self-government in 1921. As societies grow and develop and expectations and aspirations of the people evolve and become more complex, parliaments need to keep up with these developments if they are to remain relevant. More transparency and better access using technologies and accountability in the behaviour of members of parliament are two aspects that come to mind in this respect. If we fail to acknowledge the importance of such demands, together with the impact of technology and AI, artificial intelligence, which is reconfiguring the very fabric of our existence, we are at the risk of being detached from those that we are elected to represent. Regaining the lost trust of the electorate would be no easy task. In Malta, all political groups agreed to give more voice to our population by, one, giving the right to vote in local and general elections to 16-year-olds, two, by adopting positive discrimination to the least represented gender in representation in our parliament. This meant that as a result of the last general election, we added 12 women to the Maltese parliament. I am confident that many of you can agree with these notions which show that no matter where we come from, our history and experiences are indeed very similar and that we share many common challenges. Bilateral and multilateral interparliament dialogue are at the heart of this cooperation. The established parliamentary assemblies and regional parliamentary organizations such as the Interparliamentary Union, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and the Parliamentary Assembly for the Mediterranean provide a platform for parliamentarians from different countries to come together, exchange experiences and learn from each other. Through this international parliamentary cooperation, nations can learn from each other's success and failures, strengthen democratic institutions and promote democratic values globally. In the European Union, with the support of IDEA, has come to be a crucial a player. Yo no tuve nada que ver, ¿verdad? Yo. Hello? Okay. The last sentence. Soy, soy inocente de eso has been crucial in the, in a crucial player in developing the capacity of parliaments in partner countries through the Interparist project by enhancing the legislative oversight representative budgetary and administrative functions. The Maltese Parliament has had the opportunity to participate in one such project. We can unanimously say that we greatly value the potential of such a targeted and formalized cooperation. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias sobre todo por la concisión y la velocidad. Eh, quiero ahora darle la palabra al, a la honorable Urska Klasosar Supansic, presidente de la Asamblea Nacional de la República de Eslovenia. La thank palabra you. es suya por dos minutos. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will be very brief, and uh, in my intervention, I wish to make three separate points on how I see the potential of parliamentarism in enhancing democracy with and beyond national borders. First, we must prove to our citizens that parliaments genuinely lie at the center of decision-making process. And this is very important. This means parliaments must retain their sovereignty of action in all circumstances. Because the COVID-19 pandemic was a litmus test for parliamentarism to prove its role at the pinnacle of democratic life. When executive measures, even emergency measures, limit citizens' fundamental rights, they must always be based on law and subject to rigorous parliamentary scrutiny. And I wish to emphasize that again. Parliaments must build their resilience, strengthen their positions vis-a-vis -vis the executive, and apply this to their everyday operations. Secondly, parliaments should continually address inequalities permitting democratic societies 
At the, as the first female president of the National Assembly in the history of Slovenia, I wish to specifically point out the issue of gender equality. In essence, gender equality represents a fundamental question of democracy as it concerns providing equal opportunities for both halves of our population, including political representation. At a global level, unfortunately, the share of women parliamentarians still reaches only about 25%. And finally, I wish to emphasize the importance of parliamentary diplomacy and interparliamentary cooperation, such as the Honorable President of uh, the Parliament of Malawi also said. I am a strong proponent of parliamentary diplomacy, and I believe that parliamentarians should constantly learn from each other and build mutual trust and understanding through people-to-people -people contacts. Bearing in mind the value of our different political traditions, I have also tried to focus part of my own international activity on countries and parliaments from regions beyond Europe, such as North and Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia. So, ladies and gentlemen, democracy without strong parliamentarism lacks sufficient legitimacy, which underpins our citizens' trust into public institutions. Uh, parla parliaments are and should stay the most important institutions of democracy. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Presidenta Supansish. Le paso ahora la palabra con gusto a la Honorable Gabriela Morauska Staneja, Vicepresidenta del Senado de la República de Polonia. Gracias. Señoras y señores, un parlamento fuerte es crucial para el desarrollo de la democracia tanto en los estados que aspiran a establecer un sistema democrático, como también estos en los cuales la democracia funciona desde mucho tiempo ya. Merced a la cooperación interparlamentaria, los parlamentos pueden obtener preciosas indicaciones que les permiten cumplir eficazmente con sus funciones constitucionales de legislar y realizar la supervisión del poder ejecutivo, así que mantener un contacto estrecho con los ciudadanos. Pues no hay democracia sin una demo sociedad democrática. Gracias a la cooperación entre los parlamentos, sabemos también cómo modernizar nuestras instituciones para satisfacer las crecientes expectativas de los ciudadanos respecto de los parlamentarios. Nuestros electores forman parte de una sociedad de información que está funcionando en los momentos cruciales de la transición numérica y esperan que los parlamentos y los parlamentarios se adoptarán a esta realidad. No se trata únicamente de tecnología, sino también de la calidad de trabajo y accesibilidad del producto, o sea, derecho legislado. Los ciudadanos, es decir, nuestros electores, perciben los parlamentos a través del prisma de sus necesidades corrientes. Evalúan si, es, si el producto que les ofrecemos es de buena calidad, si es un derecho que funciona bien respondiendo a las necesidades de la sociedad y de la economía, o si es un producto de mala calidad como las regulaciones que hay que enmendar muchas veces porque son redactadas viciosamente de forma incomprensible para los ciudadanos incompatibles con otras normas legales. En pocas palabras, no pasan la prueba en la práctica y a menudo hasta dificultan la vida a la gente. Por lo que cooperar y compartir buenas ideas es tan importante para los parlamentos, tanto en el nivel administrativo como político. Gracias por su atención. Muchas gracias, presidenta, vicepresidenta Morauska, y la felicito por su español, que es mucho mejor que mi polaco. Tenga usted seguridad. Gracias. <risa> Le paso ahora la palabra con gusto a la honorable Elvira Kovacs, vicepresidenta de la Asamblea Nacional de la República de Serbia, que es la última persona en la lista de oradores. Les agradezco además a quienes han renunciado al uso de la palabra en aras del uso eficiente del tiempo. Um, Vicepresidenta Kovacs, uh, yeah, la palabra here. es suya. Thank you. Uh, thank you, honorable speakers of parliaments, your excellencies, distinguished colleagues. On behalf of the National Assembly of the Republic of Serbia, allow me to extend the gratitude to the Spanish 
President of the Senate and the Speaker of the Congress of Deputies for organizing this event and to wish Spain and all of you a lot of success within the parliamentary dimension of the Spanish Presidency of the Council of the EU. I would like to use this opportunity to remind us all of the United Nations statement of the reasons for marking this day. Strong parliaments are a cornerstone of democracy. They represent the voice of the people, pass laws, allocate funds to implement laws and policies, and hold governments to account. They work to make sure that policies benefit all people, especially the most vulnerable. Fully understanding the current geopolitical, security, and energy situation, we support the priorities of the Spanish Presidency and thank them for recognizing the Western Balkans again in the context of the enlargement policy, but also as an important pillar of European security and stability. For us, the enlargement process is of great importance for keeping the reform momentum going and as an additional incentive for meeting the accession criteria. It is crucial that the countries in the region cooperate in the harmonization of national legislation with the EU law, uh, take common position and jointly act before the European institutions, particularly in the spheres that will enhance our citizens' quality of life. As parliamentarians, we need to further promote cooperation uh, as we uh, are confident that it will contribute to the social, democratic and economic development of all the countries. It is up to us to work and explain to the citizens that the reforms are directly related to the EU, which is the largest foreign trade partner of Serbia and its largest investor. I would like to inv uh, invite the European Union and the governments and parliaments of its member state to support Serbia's effort and to ask for the understanding of the delicacy of our situation. We believe that Serbia, as a reliable EU partner, can make a significant contribution to Europe to achievement of peace, security and economic stability. Thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias, Vicepresidenta Kovacs. Y no tengo a nadie más en el uso de la palabra. Miren, si los parlamentos pueden funcionar con esta eficiencia y esta eficacia, hay futuro para el parlamentarismo, les puedo asegurar. Eh, en el minuto que me queda voy a aprovechar para agradecer de nuevo a quienes han organizado esta actividad, en particular a las Cortes Generales de España. Agradecer y apreciar la contribución de nuestros estupendos ponentes, el vicepresidente Caras, la presidenta Jara, la presidenta Vaz y la presidenta Adamová. Eh, realmente ha sido un gusto tener esta discusión con ustedes. Deseo además eh, la mejor de las suertes a España en el empeño que están emprendiendo eh, a partir de mañana. Es un... Es una tarea compleja y debo decir, y aquí inevitablemente me pongo el sombrero de donde vengo, que ojalá esa presidencia española haga mucho por las relaciones entre la Unión Europea y América Latina, porque es un tema que me interesa. Eh, es una oportunidad histórica que no se va a repetir pronto, por lo menos. Así que les deseo la mejor de las suertes. Y finalmente, nos deseo colectivamente la mejor de las suertes en este esfuerzo colectivo de preservar lo que es mejor en la vida democrática, porque ese esfuerzo de proteger la democracia en un momento en que está siendo asediada globalmente no es nada más ni nada menos que un esfuerzo por proteger y preservar la dignidad humana. Eso es lo que nos convoca y eso es los que, lo que nos debe hacer persistir en esta tarea. Muchas gracias, un aplauso para nuestros ponentes y... Quedamos ahora en manos de los organizadores para lo que venga. Gracias.
Tenés que tomar la cámara para no mostrar la cámara. Ocupen sus asientos, por favor. Ocupen sus asientos, por favor. Su Majestad el Rey. Bienvenidos a la sesión inaugural del Día Internacional del Parlamentarismo, este año dedicado a reforzar la democracia fortaleciendo a los parlamentos. Intervendrá en primer lugar el presidente del Senado, don Ander Gil. Don Ander Gil. Muy buenos días, bienvenidos y bienvenidas a todos y a todas a España, a Castilla y León, a León, a esta maravillosa ciudad de León. Quiero agradecer a Su Majestad el Rey, Felipe VI, que nos acompañe hoy en este acto tan, tan importante. Majestad. Presidenta del Congreso de los Diputados, querida Merichel Batet, ministro de la Presidencia, querido Félix Bolaños, querido alcalde, José Antonio Díez, alcalde de la ciudad, de esta bella ciudad que hoy nos, nos acoge, presidente de la comunidad, presidente Mañueco, delegada del, del Gobierno, miembros de la Mesa del Congreso y del Senado, parlamentarios y parlamentarias, presidentas y presidentes de diversas eh, cámaras, por supuesto, también a los representantes de diferentes organismos europeos, resto de autoridades e invitados, trabajadores y trabajadoras de las Cortes Generales, trabajadores y trabajadoras del Ayuntamiento de León, gracias a todos ellos por haber hecho posible esta importante reunión. Queridas eh, amigas y amigos, esta legislatura que acabamos, que finaliza ahora en España, ha sido, ha sido dura. Fuera de España, sin duda, también lo ha sido, pero me consta igualmente que el mundo parlamentario, ante estas dificultades, ha realizado un gran esfuerzo por afrontarlas y para demostrar con hechos que cree profundamente en el ideal democrático. Y ha sido así porque en la naturaleza de la actividad parlamentaria se aúna la esencia del juego democrático y los valores de la democracia representativa. Los parlamentos, las elecciones y el Estado de Derecho son, desde luego, su mejor manifestación. Nos reunimos hoy en León para celebrar el Día Internacional del Parlamentarismo, lugar elegido para recordar su origen y sus conquistas. 
No me extenderé demasiado en la historia porque en breve escucharemos además una voz mucho más eh, cualificada, la del profesor King. Pero sí quiero rescatar, porque es tan necesario volver la mirada atrás para reflexionar sobre algunos conceptos que considero esenciales. La limitación del poder, la representación de la ciudadanía y las formas, las diferentes formas en la toma de decisiones. Todos ellos giran en torno al parlamentarismo y la democracia y nos permiten revisar nuestros sistemas, nos permite evaluarlos, nos permite mejorarlos y, sobre todo, nos permite protegerlos. No hay cabida para el fundamentalismo institucional, como lo llama Schneider, ni para una visión lineal de la historia de la democracia. Tampoco cabe el relativismo moral y, por supuesto, tampoco cabe el todo vale. Me gustaría poder deciros que, que no hay motivo para, para preocuparse, pero estaría faltando a la verdad. Estoy, estoy preocupado. Y estoy, en cierta medida, indignado por algunas cuestiones. Se ha dicho esta mañana, es verdad. Hay gente que está cuestionando los avances más importantes conseguidos en España en materia de derechos fundamentales. Amigas y amigos, el deterioro de las democracias, la degradación de las instituciones, no nace de la casualidad. Nace de decisiones conscientes a través de personas y de organizaciones que operan en el interior de nuestras democracias. Los enemigos de las democracias no solo son externos, como los regímenes extremistas de carácter religioso o dictatorial. También, se ha dicho esta mañana, hay enemigos internos. Los populistas, los nacionalistas radicales, la extrema derecha, estos, como los llama Todorov, son los enemigos íntimos de la democracia. Algunos quieren el fin abrupto de la democracia, casi siempre mediante el uso de la violencia. Otros, los internos, la van minando lentamente hasta hacerla un proceso burocrático, hasta desnaturalizarla. Recurren a la instrumentalización de la democracia para su destrucción. Puede sonar tremendamente alarmante. De hecho, creo que, que lo es. Pero ante esta preocupante realidad, solo puedo decir que estoy convencido de que los problemas de la democracia se resuelven única y exclusivamente si sí, se resuelven con más democracia. Pero democracia no quiere decir ingenuidad, ni quiere decir una cómoda y ambigua institucionalidad mal entendida, ni tampoco dejar hacer. Democracia no quiere decir subirse a un atril para hablar y mirar hacia otro lado como si nada estuviera ocurriendo. Debemos mantener una actitud activa, comprometida y de movilización ciudadana para frenar estos ataques. No hay, no hay una ley natural que obre en favor de los derechos fundamentales, no hay una ley natural que obre en favor de la convivencia y no hay una ley natural que obre en favor de la paz social. No la hay. Nos corresponde a todos y a todas defenderla todos los días, a todas las horas y en todos los lugares. Precisamente, una de las herramientas de los populismos es la demagogia de confundir el pueblo con una multitud. Ofrecer soluciones simples a problemas que son ciertamente complejos. Y es que el razonamiento que lleva el populismo es falaz y su demagogia es tan antigua y tan ambigua como la propia democracia. Por otro lado, el populismo recurre sistemáticamente a una emoción básica de los seres humanos, efectivamente, el miedo. Como dice Humberto Eco, así se va construyendo al enemigo. Ellos son los saboteadores de la democracia, esos que utilizan falsos dilemas como el ellos o nosotros, o tus derechos frente a los derechos de otros y muchas veces los derechos de otras. Estos intentos de vaciar de contenido nuestras democracias no tendrán éxito. ¿Por qué lo creo? Porque la fortaleza de las instituciones en Europa es, es evidente. No es fácil dañar las instituciones del Estado democrático. Confío 
en la sociedad civil, que sabrá evitar que acaben con su movilización y con su base social. No menospreciemos la resiliencia y la vitalidad de nuestras democracias actuales. Cuando Steiner planteaba la abrumadora que resulta la pregunta ¿qué puede añadir cualquiera de nosotros a las inmensidades del pasado europeo? Proponía en realidad una reflexión de gran envergadura. Junto a la importancia que se da a la memoria en Europa, siempre necesaria para no olvidar y para aprender, tenemos que dar espacio también al futuro. Fortalezcamos los procesos participativos, la toma de decisiones, dialoguemos y negociemos de forma integradora. Esto es lo, podemos, lo que podemos aportar a la historia de Europa, mantener viva y fuerte la democracia liberal. Y en este punto no me resisto a adelantar parte del brillante trabajo del profesor Kim. Profesor, dice usted que el populismo es una enfermedad autoinmune de las democracias. Por eso no le falta razón cuando dice que necesitamos ciudadanos sabios, humildes, demócratas, que son conscientes de que ni ellos ni las autoridades lo saben, lo sabemos todos, todo. A ello, permítame, profesor, que añada que también necesitamos una ciudadanía que viva con pasión, que actúe con astucia y creatividad, que actúe con coraje para explicar la verdad y derrotar a la mentira. Todo esto es lo que humildemente creo que consideramos para hacer frente a la incertidumbre que vivimos en estos tiempos. Muchas gracias. Interviene a continuación la señora presidenta del Congreso de los Diputados, doña Merichel Batet. Majestad, Presidente del Senado, Presidente de la Junta de Castilla y León, Ministro de la Presidencia, Relaciones con las Cortes y Memoria Democrática, Presidente de las Cortes de la Junta de Castilla y León, Delegada del Gobierno en la Comunidad de Castilla y León, Alcalde de León, Presidentes y miembros de los Parlamentos participantes, Embajadores, Autoridades, Señoras y señores, muy buenos días de nuevo. Es un honor dar la bienvenida a Su Majestad, el Rey de España, que ha querido acompañarnos en este acto inaugural de la conferencia parlamentaria. Quiero expresar en nombre de las Cortes Generales nuestro sincero agradecimiento por su presencia, que realza la solemnidad y también el simbolismo de esta jornada. Señoras y señores, el día de hoy es importante por varias razones. La primera es que celebramos el Día Internacional del Parlamentarismo y lo hacemos del mejor modo para rendir tributo a los valores democráticos que encarnan los parlamentos, debatiendo y compartiendo reflexiones sobre el momento actual que vivimos las democracias y el papel que debemos jugar los parlamentos precisamente para fortalecerlas. Contamos con la, presente, con la presencia de representaciones de alto nivel de parlamentos de 20 países, así como del Parlamento Europeo y de la Conferencia de las Asambleas Legislativas Regionales de Europa. En particular, diez presidentes de parlamentos se encuentran hoy aquí, en León. Muchísimas gracias a todos por vuestra asistencia. La segunda razón de la importancia de esta jornada es que tiene lugar en el emplazamiento en el que se celebraron las primeras Cortes en la historia del parlamentarismo, las Cortes del antiguo Reino de León en 1188, aquí, en este mismo claustro. El silencio de estas piedras alberga una historia de más de 900 años. El simbolismo de esta ubicación va a contribuir, a buen seguro, a que nuestro debate sea amplio y profundo, conscientes de nuestro pasado, pero sobre todo conscientes de la importancia de construir el futuro. 
Finalmente, la tercera razón es la temática que vamos a abordar. En los últimos años hemos asistido a fenómenos de distinta naturaleza y alcance que tienen en común el poner en cuestión la fortaleza de nuestros sistemas democráticos. Hemos visto imágenes que nos han causado estupor y preocupación sobre cómo es posible que se produzcan ataques tan graves a la institucionalidad en democracias asentadas. Constatamos una creciente polarización en las sociedades democráticas que impacta directamente sobre la calidad del debate público y sobre la agenda de asuntos que generan atención mediática. El sistema comunicativo se ha transformado por la extensión de nuevos canales como las redes sociales que han impulsado la simplificación y la espectacularización de los mensajes, la fragmentación de las audiencias, la propagación del odio y de la desinformación. También asistimos a la competencia de regímenes autoritarios que de distintas formas intentan condicionar el correcto funcionamiento de nuestras democracias. En este contexto de amenazas es crucial que compartamos nuestros análisis y sobre todo, sobre todo que establezcamos un marco común de acción. Frente a amenazas comunes debemos unirnos. No sé si ha habido una edad de oro del parlamentarismo, pero lo que sí existe es una idea compartida de parlamento, de los valores que encarna como institución y de las funciones que debe ejercer. El parlamento es, se ha dicho esta mañana, la institución democrática por excelencia, donde se conjugan participación y representación. Es la casa de la palabra y también, no lo olvidemos, la casa de la escucha. Es el lugar donde se contrastan ideas y proyectos y donde se median los conflictos y se concilian las diferencias. Cumplen los parlamentos las funciones esenciales de representar el pluralismo de la sociedad, favorecer y garantizar la gobernabilidad y promover la integración a través de los acuerdos y del respeto al equilibrio mayoría-minoría. Todo esto son valores y principios compartidos, pero ante los retos que enfrentamos como democracias parlamentarias sigue siendo determinante hoy, como en los tiempos de Burke o Constant, el papel de los representantes. Somos los representantes de los ciudadanos quienes asumimos no solo el privilegio de la representación, sino también el deber, el deber de que nuestra actuación preserve y sea coherente con los valores de tolerancia, respeto y pluralismo consustanciales al sistema democrático. Nos corresponde ser ejemplares a la hora de desarrollar nuestras funciones. Nuestras palabras y nuestros actos tienen un valor propedéutico para los ciudadanos. Según nos estimen, así estimarán a la institución, al Parlamento. Por eso creo firmemente que nosotros, los representantes, somos la primera línea de defensa de la democracia parlamentaria. En la conferencia de hoy vamos a tener la oportunidad de reflexionar conjuntamente sobre las amenazas y los retos que tenemos como sistemas parlamentarios. El alto nivel de los participantes asegura que el debate será muy valioso para todos. Lo ha sido ya esta mañana. Estoy convencida de que los resultados serán provechosos para todos nosotros. Quisiera acabar estas palabras remarcando que la presencia de Su Majestad el Rey dota de un especial valor a este acto. Es expresión de la naturaleza parlamentaria de nuestra monarquía constitucional y asimismo subraya el carácter esencial de los parlamentos en la arquitectura institucional de nuestros estados democráticos. Gracias, Majestad, por acompañarnos. Muchas gracias a todos por escuchar. A continuación, toma la palabra Su Majestad el Rey.
Muy buenos días a todos. Presidenta del Congreso de los Diputados, Presidente del Senado, gracias por sus palabras. Presidente de la Junta de Castilla y León, Ministro de la Presidencia, Relaciones con las Cortes y Memoria Democrática, Presidente de las Cortes de la Junta de Castilla y León, Delegada del Gobierno en la Comunidad de Castilla y León, Alcalde de León, Presidentes y Presidentas, miembros de los Parlamentos participantes en esta importante cita, Monseñor y Padre Abad, que nos acogen aquí en la Real Colegiata, Embajadores, autoridades, señoras y señores. Me presento ante ustedes con profundo respeto hacia lo que ustedes representan y hacia los que ustedes representan. Es un honor muy especial para mí inaugurar hoy aquí en, en León y con todos ustedes esta conferencia con la que conmemoramos el Día Internacional del Parlamentarismo. Y me alegra poder darles también la bienvenida a España y a esta querida ciudad, a presidentes y delegaciones representantes de parlamentos europeos, así como de terceros países asociados. Reflexionar sobre el funcionamiento de nuestros parlamentos y sobre cómo fortalecerlos en su papel esencial para el buen funcionamiento de la democracia es siempre una tarea necesaria, una tarea útil y una tarea benéfica. La vitalidad de nuestras instituciones depende en buena medida de la adhesión y confianza que concitan entre los ciudadanos. Son las ideas las creencias compartidas sobre su valor y utilidad, las que contribuyen a su legitimidad. De ahí que debatir sobre la institución parlamentaria, sobre sus retos de presente y futuro, que van a pormenorizar al detalle en esta conferencia, constituye en sí misma una forma de mejorar nuestra gobernanza. En definitiva, Reforzando el parlamentarismo, creo que todos aquí podemos y coincidimos, de hecho, en que reforzando el parlamentarismo, como digo, ayudaremos a construir sociedades más robustas, más estables, más seguras de sí mismas y más capaces de resolver sus problemas. Esta reflexión resulta muy necesaria y pertinente en las circunstancias actuales en las que los presupuestos de nuestra vida democrática se ven erosionados. Los desafíos y amenazas que enfrentan nuestras democracias pueden ser parecidos o en ocasiones son de distinta naturaleza y alcance, pero identificarlos y establecer un marco compartido de soluciones e incluso de colaboración es una labor sobre cuya urgencia, sin lugar a dudas, todos estamos de acuerdo. Señoras y señores, que esta conferencia tenga lugar en León y se celebre precisamente aquí, en la Real Colegiata y Basílica de San Isidro, tiene, como no se les escapa y, y habrán escuchado ya con frecuencia, un hondo significado. Además de ser uno de nuestros grandes tesoros del románico y panteón de reyes, en este lugar, como saben, se celebraron en 1188, bajo el recién estrenado reinado del jovencísimo, con 16 años, rey Alfonso IX de León, las primeras cortes históricamente documentadas. Fueron las primeras en las que se integró el estamento popular en una asamblea de este tipo, lo que hace a las Cortes Leonesas de aquel año un hito excepcional, no solo en la historia política y social de España, 
sino en la de toda Europa. En aquellas cortes se otorgaron los conocidos como decreta o carta magna leonesa, que garantizaban la protección de las personas y los bienes de los entonces súbditos contra todo abuso de poder y en la que ya se describen derechos individuales. Las ideas nucleares de la institución parlamentaria cobraron expresión en estos mismos muros, comunidad, participación, representación, baluarte de libertades, equilibrios de poder. Se trata de un hecho histórico que se adentra en una generación que se adelanta, perdón, en una generación a otras manifestaciones tempranas similares de parlamentarismo. Ese carácter inaugural o pionero, si me permiten, de las Cortes Leonesas y su Carta Magna fueron reconocidos por la UNESCO en 2013 al declarar León como cuna del parlamentarismo y cito, testimonio documental más antiguo del sistema parlamentario europeo. Desde luego, la idea del Parlamento ha evolucionado desde sus orígenes medievales, por no retrotraernos a otros modelos pretéritos y clásicos de la Grecia, Antigua Grecia y Antigua Roma. Ha densificado su significado netamente democrático como asamblea que representa a la soberanía popular y que, en virtud de esa legitimación democrática directa, ostenta las principales potestades públicas, hacer las leyes, aprobar el presupuesto y la función de control del Poder Ejecutivo. La institución parlamentaria y el sistema democrático se asienta sobre el derecho de todos los ciudadanos a participar en los asuntos públicos, un derecho que presupone a su vez la existencia de una opinión pública libre es decir, de un discurso abierto a todos, en el que se pueda acceder a ideas, puntos de vista, hechos, datos e informaciones con los que cada ciudadano pueda tomar sus propias decisiones. Democracia es debate, es confrontación de ideas y, y posiciones, pero dentro de un espacio común en el que se comparte la creencia en el valor de la verdad, del respeto, y la tolerancia frente al rechazo y la negación del otro, en el que se comparte el valor del bien común frente al egoísmo excluyente. El pluralismo caracteriza a las sociedades contemporáneas y el papel fundamental de las instituciones representativas es conciliar y mediar las divergencias que puedan existir. El Parlamento desempeña, pues, la función básica de articular esa pluralidad y dar un sentido común a la acción co colectiva, reivindicar esa misión de la institución parlamentaria es plenamente actual. Señoras y señores, el alma de Europa es hoy la democracia. Los impulsos en la construcción del proyecto europeo han venido de la voluntad de los ciudadanos de reforzar y ampliar la Unión. Los parlamentos han desempeñado un papel determinante en ese proceso porque la idea de Europa es inseparable de lo que representan las asambleas parlamentarias. La pluralidad, el respeto a las diferencias, la voluntad de aproximar para avanzar el debate y el acuerdo como herramientas de progreso. Frente al ataque a los valores europeos que ha supuesto la invasión rusa de Ucrania, los parlamentos de la Unión han mostrado no solo su solidaridad con el pueblo ucraniano, sino también la voluntad de unidad en la defensa de los principios que nos hacen europeos. Ese momento de unidad frente a la amenaza, que es la guerra ilegal, también debe replicarse frente a las distintas amenazas y riesgos que afrontan en nuestro tiempo las democracias parlamentarias. Se trata de amenazas que trascienden las fronteras y que son comunes a todos, por lo que las respuestas también 
deben de ser compartidas. La conferencia que hoy se inaugura hoy aquí es una oportunidad para avanzar en ese camino. La presencia de representaciones de alto nivel de los parlamentos europeos y no solo europeos asegura un debate positivo y fructífero. La historia que albergan estos muros sin duda favorecerá la mejor disposición para que esa reflexión sea valiosa y constructiva. Con estos mimbres estoy convencido de que la jornada será un éxito. Así que a todos les deseo un magnífico trabajo. Muchas gracias. Concluida la sesión inaugural de la conferencia, dará comienzo una sesión de trabajo para cuya presentación tomará palabra el presidente del Senado, don Ander Gil. Muy buenos días otra vez. Contamos hoy como invitado con el profesor John King. El profesor King, nacido en el sur de Australia, imparte sus clases de política en la Universidad de Sydney y en el Centro de Ciencias Sociales de Berlín. John King fue educado en las universidades de Adelaida y Toronto, así como en el King's College en la Universidad de Cambridge. Es fundador del primer centro para el estudio de la democracia del mundo en Londres, en 1989. Y también es cofundador y director de Sydney Democracy Network. Es reconocido mundialmente como uno de los grandes pensadores y escritores políticos actuales por sus trabajos acerca de las democracias y su historia. Su obra, conocida, Vida y muerte de la democracia, es considerada la principal referencia en este campo. Señor King, profesor, vivimos tiempos complejos, pero también muy confusos. Tiempos en los que proliferan los relatos de quienes dudan de la capacidad de la democracia y de sus instituciones, y también de individuos que directamente la atacan. Tiempos en los que no abundan precisamente los mensajes de aliento. Los suyos, profesor, sin duda lo son. Sus reflexiones nos alientan, nos animan y también nos hacen reaccionar ante esta realidad tan abrumadoramente compleja. Y también nos hacen mucho bien porque nos avisan. Quiero darle las gracias por todo ello de corazón. Me parece todo un acierto que sea usted, profesor, quien nos explique el valor del primer ejercicio documentado del parlamentarismo de la historia. Creo que es usted el primer estudioso que ha dado luz al origen real de las primeras experiencias parlamentarias, más allá de relatos históricos casi míticos de algunas potencias. Hoy sabemos que de este parlamentarismo incipiente en León bebieron otras iniciativas que siglos después fueron dando forma a la democracia representativa. Varios fueron los elementos originarios que se han ido desarrollando y que han llegado al parlamentarismo de nuestros días. El primero fue la limitación del poder real. Pero no olvidemos que hablamos del año 1188. Este paso, aparentemente indiscutible, tiene desde luego mucho mérito. El segundo la representación del pueblo por vecinos de las propias ciudades, aunque todavía no de manera electiva. Y por último, que se revelaron como una nueva forma de toma de decisiones que tenía en cuenta intereses diversos. Creo que existe una coincidencia elemental entre esa experiencia parlamentaria y los parlamentos democráticos actuales, el ánimo de ordenar y garantizar derechos individuales y colectivos de la sociedad. Me parece, por otra parte, que cada vez se conoce más la historia de las Cortes de León. Y creo que el espíritu de aquellas primeras Cortes representa el despertar de los pueblos a una nueva forma de relacionarse con el poder y también de tomar conciencia 
de que podían, de que podían ejercerlo. Quizás otra enseñanza que podemos extraer de aquellas cortes es que Alfonso IX comprendió que su propio interés dependía de la satisfacción de los intereses del conjunto de los estamentos, una apreciación igual de legítima hoy en las monarquías parlamentarias. Hoy celebramos la democracia en cada uno de nuestros países y lo hacemos juntos, porque cuando se reúnen representantes de la soberanía popular, cuando lo hacen en libertad y fieles al mandato del pueblo y cuando lo hacen en el lugar que fue la cuna del parlamentarismo, nos invade la satisfacción de que el ideal democrático, a pesar de algunos, sigue vivo. Pero junto a estos logros, el profesor King, y debiéramos señalarlo singularmente, nos advierte sobre las amenazas presentes contra la democracia, las externas y especialmente las internas. También nos traslada un mensaje de esperanza sobre nuestra capacidad para frenarlas y, sin duda, nos alerta para que actuemos a tiempo, subraya él. Debo decirle, profesor, que la extrema lucidez de su apreciación sobre los democidios, democidios, como los llama usted, nos aportan luz sobre la compleja situación que vivimos hoy. Una de las formas lentas de democidio es, según usted, el populismo. Este populismo al que aludí anteriormente y que tan sigilosamente pretende acabar con nuestras democracias. Afirma usted así que la democracia muere cuando un gobierno elegido democráticamente manipula y destruye de forma sutil las instituciones de la democracia constitucional. En definitiva, desmantelar la democracia en nombre de la propia democracia. Sin embargo, el profesor King nos anima a huir del catastrofismo y nos invita a analizar el democidio con más cautela y, sobre todo, con más profundidad. Dar el lugar merecido a los cimientos de la sociedad civil sobre la que descansa cualquier democracia. El profesor King nos transmite en toda su obra un conocimiento profundo sobre el recorrido histórico y el significado de la democracia, pero sobre todo, sobre todo, profesor, nos invita a la reflexión sobre su presente y sobre su futuro. En su obra, Vida y muerte de la democracia, nos descubre además la democracia monitorizada, que ha sucedido a la asamblearia y a la representativa. Y justo ahora, cuando nos sentimos eufóricos ante un modelo que reconoce a la sociedad civil su justo protagonismo, nos advierte que la democracia monitorizada tiene un enemigo peligroso, quizás hasta, capacidad, hasta capaz de neutralizarla. Sí, nuevamente me refiero al populismo. Gracias, profesor. Gracias por su compromiso intelectual y personal para hacer de este mundo más justo y, sobre todo, un lugar más humano. Estamos deseando escucharle. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, profesor Kim. Muchas gracias. Majestad el Rey, Your Majesty, Right Honorable Señor Gil, Right Honorable Señora Batet, Damas y Caballeros, Ciudadanos, Ciudadanas, Ladies and Gentlemen, Buenos Dias, Hola a todas, Muchas Gracias por la Invitación a León. That's the end of my Spanish. Ladies and Gentlemen, we have already heard that more than eight centuries ago, in these magnificent sandstone cloisters, a young king convened the world's first parliament of representatives. The beginning was unexpected, a surprise so startling and precious that later generations jostled to lay claim to its fame, as in England, where politicians and historians have long been fond of saying that their House of Commons is the mother of parliaments. The little room, as Winston Churchill said, 
in the dark year of 1917 that serves as the shrine of the world's liberties. Well, my La Vida y Muerta de la Democracia politely questioned this English prejudice. It showed how, in the spring month of March 1188, in this walled former Roman town of Leon, a full generation before King John's Magna Carta of 1215, King Alfonso Noveno did something extraordinary. He invented an instrument of government, soon to be called a Cortes, or a parliament, a place where differences of opinion were freely debated and laws made peacefully based on negotiated agreements among representatives of various social interests drawn from a wide geographic radius. The remarkable invention came laced with ironies. The Cortes was among Europe's first precious gifts to the world of modern representative democracy. Yet the unfashionable word democracy played no role in its birth. There was another irony. The world's first parliament stood for the open acceptance of differences, yet it was a child of recolonization and empire building, a moment in the bitter Reconquista military struggle of Christians to snatch fields and towns from the Muslims of northern Iberia to set Spain on a course to become the greatest power in early modern Europe. At the heart of these ironies stood King Alfonso. At the ripe age of 17, returning from exile in Portugal, he accepted the crown of a kingdom beset with military, monetary, and morale problems. The young king was inexperienced, wet behind the ears, but he caught his doubters and foes off guard. He sprang a large surprise. Was he the bullfighter, so sure of his coming demise that fear lost its grip and courage made possible his fight back? Had exile taught him the art of historical intuition? That is the phrase of uh, the famous Spanish philosopher Ortega y Yacé, this precious sixth sense of knowing what will work and what won't work in any given circumstance. We can't be sure. What is clear is that Alfonso chose to convene the first ever meeting with representatives of the leading local estates. He gambled with his crown. Young Alfonso turned to the local nobility, the warrior aristocrats who were committed in their bones to the reconquest of their lands. He called as well on the bishops of the church, the estate that saw itself as the guardian of souls and the spiritual protector of God's lands. And he summoned the citizens of the towns, the kiwis, the moneyed good men, the boni homines, respected for their role as elected officers of the town councils called fueros. It was from within inside this medieval triangle comprising the nobles, the bishops, and urban citizens, the representatives of soldiers, souls, and money, that the modern practice of parliamentary representation was magically born. What happened here in Leon wasn't breaking news. This was not yet the age of breaking news, but the first ever Cortes as contemporaries soon christened it, radically altered the poetry of politics. It gave a new meaning to the word Cortes, which until then had been the local term for both the town where a king resides and a city council whose representatives made proposals and demands and granted services to a monarch. As for the word representation, procurador, there's an outside chance from my research that locals had absorbed the notion from local Muslims, for whom a legal representative, a wakil, was a religious judge chosen by a merchant to act in his stead, for instance, handling his lawsuits and acting as the merchant's banker and postmaster. The members of the first Cortes who gathered here were certainly familiar with the Latin term procurator, 
It referred to a man who acts as an agent of another man with his consent. It referred to someone authorized to appear before a court to defend another person in a lawsuit or dispute. It was a word, procurator, that was used as well to speak of an official known as the procurador general who took care of the property and well-being of the city who, or who acted as a guardian of the interests of the poor, a procurador de pobres. The Léon Parliament transformed the language of politics. It was also a great refusal of absolute monarchy. This Cortes was no gathering where monarchs waved the flags of courtly pomp to impress their subjects on bended knee. Against the backdrop of war, the old custom of meeting to swear fealty to a sovereign's will was cast aside. Tough bargaining among conflicting social interests in the presence of the king was the new monarch. A parliamentary monarchy was born. The first parliament was held in these cloisters of the Church of San Isidoro, named in honor of the good Bishop of Seville, who was famous for his maxim that only those who govern well are true monarchs. This um, Cortes produced up to 15 decrees. The authenticity of several is disputed. That together amounted to something like a constitutional charter. The king promised that in matters of war and peace, pacts and treaties, he would hereon consult and accept the advice of the bishops, the nobles, and the good men of the towns. It was agreed that property and security of residents were inviolable. The representatives accepted that judicial proceedings and the laws they produced would be respected. It was also agreed that there would be future meetings of the king and the estates. We need to pay attention to the profound historical and political significance of what happened here in Leon. The assembly was the first recorded gathering of all three estates. The interests of the towns had hitherto been ignored in meetings convened by the monarch of the region. We could say the surprise inclusion of the towns was the beginning of many centuries of social and political struggle to equalize parliamentary representation, a struggle that's by no means over today. But there was more. The assembly of representatives of the nobility, church, and towns promised a new way of governing. The Cortes method of handling power supposed that guarantees of fair play could foster political deals among conflicting interests without resorting to the use of naked force. In striking contrast, say, to ancient Athens and its democracy, where citizens feared division and supposed that democracy required an undivided sense of political community, the Cortes rested on the opposite precept, on the unavoidability of competing and conflicting interests, and for the sake of the common good, the desirability of forging peaceful compromises among them. Please allow me briefly to put things a bit more abstractly. We could say that the Cortes redefined politics in four ways. First, its embrace of representation sharpened people's sense of the contingency or alterability of power relations. The Cortes questioned arbitrary power. It encouraged representatives to summon up the courage to tell the king to go to hell. Well before the age of party politics, the Cortes also underlined the point that representatives don't necessarily share the same realities and that parliaments are therefore spaces in which reality itself becomes contestable and negotiable. The Cortes, we could say, anticipated Cervantes. It destroyed the metaphysics of reality. Within its walls, representatives affirmed that things always have at least two sides, that the windmills of hard reality are inescapably shaped by interpretations that lend them significance. But the Cortes had a third important effect. 
It offered the possibility of turning disagreements about reality into binding agreements in support of the common good. During these years, Spain was not yet a country, of course. It was very much an invertebrate polity, again, to quote Ortega y Hase. It was paralyzed by social divisions, rebellion, and threats of war. So the Cortes offered the possibility of combining social and political divisions into a more integrated polity, making a people with straightened spines, a people bound together by their reliance upon parliamentary institutions and agreed laws backed by the king. And finally, the Cortes made possible long-distance government. It widened its footprints. The Cortes showed that representative governments could govern their subjects at arm's length without losing their trust and consent, exactly because those involved in making decisions were entitled to snap at the heels of the monarch to defend their respective interests in his presence. What do we know about the subsequent fate of the Cortes of Leon? Well, encouraged by military victories over the Moors, the surviving evidence shows that the Cortes managed to survive for several centuries. Long-distance government based on the consent of its subjects worked. Indeed, by the end of the 14th century, following a merger of the neighboring kingdoms of Leon and Castile, the kingdom's representatives enjoyed considerable powers, their right of gathering and presenting petitions, their insistence that agreements st uh, struck by the parliament were legally binding became customary. Yes, there was plenty of strife. The Cortes was the site of intense bargaining about definitions of the welfare of the realm. Money was often the key cause of friction. There were constant reminders by the representatives that the kings were forbidden from levying extraordinary taxes without the explicit consent of all the estates. Before the end of the 14th century, there were times when the Cortes reportedly demanded an audit of the court's expenditure, even rebates on taxes that had already been paid. The new Léon style of government proved geographically infectious. During the 13th century, Parliament spread from Leon and Castile to Aragon, Catalonia, Valencia and Navarre, to Sicily and Portugal, England and Ireland, and the empires of Austria and Brandenburg. During the next two centuries, Parliaments appeared in the large majority of German principalities in Scotland, Denmark, Sweden, France, the Netherlands, Poland and Hungary. Nearly all of these late medieval and early modern parliaments survived until the 17th and early 18th centuries. Despite the growth of absolute estates, which crushed the assemblies of Aragon, Catalonia, and Valencia, many continued to function until the eruption of the French Revolution in 1789. The Navarrese Cortes, the Swedish Riksdag, the Hungarian Diet lasted into the 19th century. The powerful estates of the Duchy of Mecklenburg survived intact until 1918. By that time, with the collapse of empires and a catastrophic world war, a laboratory of democracy in which uh, Europe resembles, as Tomasz Masaryk put it, a laboratory atop a, a vast graveyard. It was in this period after 1918, a period in which Europe was a laboratory of democracy, that most European parliaments were besieged by political parties, trade unions, suffragists and suffragettes, and other citizens demanding universal suffrage. Many observers expected the dawn of parliamentary democracy, but as we know, the cruel opposite happened. The butterfly of parliamentary democracy became the caterpillar of arbitrary rule. The long democratic revolution unleashed by young King Alfonso was stillborn. Here's another irony. Just as the people mounted the stage of history after 1918, demanding one person, one vote, parliaments were racked by factional disputes, fierce resistance, 
and acts of violent sabotage. In Yugoslavia, Romania and other countries, monarchs strangled parliaments. Military-backed dictators also savaged their parliaments, as happened in Pilsudski's Poland. Totalitarian rule triumphed in Italy, Germany, Russia, and Spain, and also in China, which might otherwise have become the world's largest parliamentary republic. During these first decades of the 20th century, the downfall and disappearance of parliaments gathered pace. Politicians dressed in frock coats and top hats, all of them men, grew scared. Lenin spoke of the spirit of dead bourgeois parliamentarism. It certainly fractured and paralyzed parliaments in this period. Governments rose and fell in quick time in Portugal, whose first 15 years of republican government had been marred by dozens of governments, eight presidents, and countless attempted coup d'etat, the words of the new dictator Salazar blew like a winter wind across the whole continent and well beyond. So long as there is not some retrograde movement in political evolution, Salazar said in 1934, I am convinced that within 20 years there will be no legislative assemblies left in Europe. Salazar's wishful prediction almost came true. By 1941, there were only 11 parliamentary democracies left on our planet. Only three survived in Europe, Britain, Sweden, and Switzerland. But what then happened? Well, historians and political scientists tell us the good news that after World War II, parliamentary government made a stupendous political comeback. The not so good news is that the long post-1945 renaissance of parliaments is in my view today losing momentum. We have heard many laments of this kind this morning. There's certainly writing on the walls of parliaments. We are living through times in which parliaments are again plagued by legitimacy and performance problems. We need to pay special attention to this new trend. My point is we aren't backsliding to former times, say to the catastrophes of the 1920s or 1930s, or even to the world of overnight emergencies of the kind that gripped Spain on February 23, 1981, the moment described with great precision in Javier Cercas's Anatomia de un Instante, a wonderful book which describes how, in a hail of bullets, a frightened Cortes fell to the floor and was held hostage for six hours by Holpistas. More recent events in Bolivia, Burkina Faso, Mali, Myanmar, Sudan, Thailand, and Yemen suggest that armies are still enemies of parliament. But in my view, the forces threatening the integrity of parliaments are nowadays different. They seem more banal. Their rhythm is different. But I want to say that these new threats, if left unthreatened, will in the long run destroy parliaments as effectively as happened a century ago in the heartlands of Europe. What are these new sources of ruination? Most obviously, rising tides of reputational damage are lapping around parliament's doorsteps. Look at what is going on in France. Cynicism, grumbling, ressentiment, angry citizens' protests are becoming commonplace. On an already overheated planet, parliaments are said to be hot air chambers, mere talk shops, fabricators of unreality, warehouses of division, irrelevance and incompetence. Parliaments are the butt of bitter jokes. My father was Irish. Uh, he was working class. He liked to say that there was only ever in history one man who entered Parliament with honest intentions, and that man was Guy Fawkes, otherwise known as Guido Fawkes, of course, who was um, the plotter uh, who was hanged by the neck for uh, planning to blow up the House of Commons. He was, of course, a Catholic, and he was on the side of Catholic Spain. This was my father's joke. Uh, guy Fawkes was the only honest guy who ever was a representative in Parliament. 
Well, tomfoolery and contempt for politicians from the out, uh, harm parliaments from the outside, but just as worrying are, I think, the forces of decadence within the walls of parliaments. There's not just the grandstanding, the slam-bang rancor, the misogyny, and the cluelessness of more than a few politicians. Parliaments are materially corrupted by the combined forces of lobbyists, dark money merchants, and revolving doors. Take the United States. In Washington, D.C., this tangled complex of government agencies, think tanks, corporations, academics, and lobbyists with big toes in the lawmaking world of uh, Congress is known for obvious reasons as the blob. Something similar is happening in the European Union, where in Brussels alone, nearly 12,000 organizations on the current voluntary EU lobby register declare that each year they spend a total of just under 2 billion euros on their craft. There are at least 7,500 organizations that operate without scrutiny in and around the European Parliament. Whatever you think of the ethics of lobbying, the fact is government by moonlight is a growing problem in every parliamentary democracy. Mandatory accountability registered, registers, comprehensive integrity checks to ensure ethical fair play among lobbyists are typically in short supply. India's lower chamber, known as the Lok Sabha, is the nightmare instance of what happens when lobbying, dirty money, shady deals, blackmail, and criminality get the upper hand. In what is otherwise known as the world's largest democracy, more money is spent in India on elections than in the United States, even though average per capita income is only 3% of U.S. levels. There's no state funding for political parties, and there's no proper regulation of party finances. The upshot is that in Mr. Modi's India, Parliament becomes a place uh, where business deals happen, where organized crime uh, 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 operates, and where there is, it's an Indian specialty, resort politics happens. This is the practice when there is an attempt to push through a law where speakers of parliaments and leaders of parliaments take their representatives to a resort hotel, usually five or six star, and they bribe them to vote in a certain way. I, I don't think you should get any ideas uh, about this. But the consequence in India following the 2019 elections is that 43% of members of parliament in the lower house have declared criminal cases against them, self-declaration is an election rule. 29% confessed to serious criminal charges which include murder, attempted murder, kidnapping, rape, and other crimes against women. The Indian case shows how, in the name of democracy, parliaments can slowly become nothing less than big meetings of more or less corrupted souls. The old saying that the word politics comes from poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning blood-sucking parasites, then applies with a cruel vengeance. The decadence that I'm describing is perfected when parliaments fall victim to executive capture, to what Thomas Jefferson called elective despotism. In more than a few of today's democracies, the center of gravity is shifting from parliaments towards media-spun presidential rule. When this colonization of parliaments happens, the spirit of the Leon Cortes is replaced by the mantra of Charles de Gaulle. Politics is much too serious a matter to be left to elected, time-wasting politicians. The trend resembles a slow-motion coup d'etat. It is backed by tactics, we've heard some of them this morning, tactics such as government whipping, gag orders, voter deregistration, emergency rule, talk of budget constraints, punishments of whistleblowers, kickbacks and favors, and the encirclement of parliament by hand-selected appointments of friendly bureaucrats, judges, and other high officials. All this happened or began to happen during the Donald Trump presidency in the United States. 
Things grow worse when populist parties and their demagogues get their paws on the levers of government. Populism accelerates the transition to elective despotism. In effect, populists and their demagogues want permanently to prorogue parliaments. Populists like Edoyan, Kai Said, AMLO in Mexico, Vucic, Kaczynski, they favor executive rule. They prefer what the English used to call rump parliaments, chambers that resemble chunks of rotting meat infected with maggots, parliamentary representatives who in the name of the people do little more than serve their executive masters on bended knees. Things grow much worse, in my view, when populist governments privatize and marketize whole areas of life. When so-called neoliberalism gets the upper hand, parliaments are blindsided. They become complicit in the growth of what could be called democracy exclusion zones, self-regulating banks, lawless tax havens, secret military industrial complexes, unregulated data harvesting media corporations, all of whom decide things without parliamentary scrutiny and legislative constraint. So in this 30-minute sweeping summary of the institution that you know much better than I do, what can we say about the future of parliaments? Well, when thinking about these various decadent trends, it's tempting to conclude that the post-1945 renaissance of parliaments is coming to an end, even that we're already entering the age of what I call phantom parliaments, legislatures in more than a few countries that are simultaneously real and not real. They're form without much content. Some might welcome a shift to phantom parliaments and executive rule. But before the carver is poured, let's consider the counter trends and the reasons why in these years of the 21st century, the Cortes model of government remains indispensable, or so I want to say to you. I want to say that, in, that nothing is set in stone. To speak in quantum terms, contemporary parliaments are in a state of superposition. Just as the fate of Schrödinger's cat in a box was undecidable, so parliaments are today suspended unpredictably between alternative outcomes. Fightbacks are possible. They are necessary. Remarkably, renewals are happening at multiple points on our planet. Consider Denmark's uh, Folketinget. In meetings called consultations, it pow its powerful European Affairs Committee regularly grills ministers real time during sessions of the Council of the European Union. The National Assembly of the Republic of Korea has signed off on the world's first comprehensive laws against verbal abuse and bullying. And bullying, kapchil is the Korean word, uh, bullying and verbal abuse by family-run conglomerates and other powerful organizations. Romania's parliament is now digitally fed citizen suggestions and complaints with the help of E.ON, uh, sharing my name, John, an AI smart no uh, robot, say the comedians in Romania, designed to improve the intelligence of politicians. In September, Bebelbas has already mentioned, the German Bundestag will begin receiving non-binding reports from lottery-selected citizens' assemblies. Parliaments are also heavily preoccupied with time past and time future. The Welsh legislature regularly consults with the, first, uh, the world's first Future Generations Commission. New Zealand's parliament has granted ecosystems the rights, powers, duties, and liabilities of a legal person. The cross-border Nordic network of Sami parliaments, a case of interparliamentary cooperation, promotes indigenous self-determination, and so on. How are we to make good sense of this new wave of experiments? My suggestion is to see them as points on a larger canvas, single performances in a grand 
carnival of parliamentary efforts to rejuvenate the spirit of the Cortes. Shadows are certainly falling on too many of the world's parliaments, but these innovations, I believe, are the first signs of a dawn of renewal. These parliamentary experiments are today doing what parliaments did for over eight centuries. In the name of the common wheel, they represent the claims and interests of the represented. They are significant because they remind us that parliamentary representation is by definition tricky business. Populists and demagogues be warned. Representation is not a simple face-to-face -face contract between a representative and an imaginary people or nation. Representation isn't mimesis. It has a vicarious, fiduciary quality. And this means that when voters choose a representative, representation is as much an ending as it is a beginning. Representation is an open-ended process contingent upon the assent, disappointment, and displeasure of the represented. When representatives underperform or fail on too many fronts, they are sent to hell in a handbasket. These principles of representation, traceable to the Leon Cortes, convened by Alfonso uh, the, uh, Noveno, are most definitely alive and kicking in the new parliamentary experiments. That's why today textbooks still tell us that the prime task of parliaments is to represent the interests of citizens by means of free and fair elections. But I want to say to you uh, this morning that there is an error within the textbooks. Because if we look more closely at, uh, at what today's smart activist parliaments are actually doing, we see there's something new, something very 21st century and of great historical significance ignored by the textbooks. Parliaments, I want to say, aren't just chambers where elected politicians represent their constituents. In our age of monetary democracy, Democracia monitorizada, legislators are becoming what I wish to call watchdog parliaments. In the name of the common good, they blow whistles, they sound alarms, they warn of wicked problems, and they pass laws to push back or ban power exercised arbitrarily. The contrast with parliaments of yesteryear couldn't be clearer. You can only see this with a sense of history, with a sense of uh, a pair of eyes in the backs of your heads. Think of it this way. The first ever Cortes was born of military reconquest. Parliaments of the more recent past were too often the castles of the aristocracy. They were bourgeois mansions. They were parlors of male privilege. They were also engines of empire. By contrast, today's watchdog parliaments when they work well, stand against conquest in all its various forms. Especially when generously resourced, watchdog parliaments specialize in the public scrutiny and restraint of predatory power. They stand against foolish governments which abuse their power. Watchdog parliaments snap the chains of majority rule, the blind worship of numbers, by granting voices and rights to minorities excluded from high politics. These parliaments also alter our shared sense of time. They extend the vote, the franchise, to endangered species, to wronged ancestors and future generations. In opposition, say, to predatory corporations, greedy banks, rogue mining com companies, watchdog parliaments protect and promote the rules of the democratic game. Not to be underestimated is the way they tackle long-term problems currently neglected by the short-term mentality of election cycles. Ladies and gentlemen, my time's up. My farewell idea is that watchdog parliaments are more than the guardians of electoral integrity. As champions of the public monitoring and restraint of power, they target complex, difficult, wicked problems. Their job is to find just solutions in such matters as artificial intelligence, tax havens, polluted environments, pestilences, stateless peoples, and 
the business of ending wars. When performing these functions, paradoxically, watchdog parliaments push beyond what used to be called the parliamentary road and the fetish of periodic elections. Actually, they help redefine democracy because they give it teeth. Electoral democracy becomes monetary democracy. Democracy comes to mean nothing less than free and fair elections, but something much more. Citizens' freedom from predatory power in all its ugly forms, including our unsustainably reckless relationship with the earth on which we dwell. It's true that these new watchdog parliaments are fragile. There are no grand political theories that come to their defense. Think of John Stuart Mill's classic 19th century considerations on representative government. These watchdog parliaments lack how to do it operating manuals. This is to say that watchdog parliaments enjoy no historical guarantees of success. Except to future historians, their chances of survival are currently unknown. The only thing that's certain is that the spirit of these watchdog parliaments, the spirit of young King Alfonso Noveno, is the grit we humans are going to need as we struggle wisely, equitably, democratically with the rich opportunities and cascading dangers of our 21st century. I know you are all hungry, so I shall simply say muchas gracias, jacqui varm, herzlichen dank, ad zikomo quambiri, kuzenem, merci boku, fala, thank you very much. Advertimos a los señores participantes que el almuerzo está servido en el claustro.
está, ¿no? Bien, te toqué. And uh, she says it's, it's quite uh, easy, uh, even to Romania. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to, to start with the second table. I know that after lunch, uh, always is more difficult to keep the concentrate, but we are, we are going to, to try to have uh, an interest uh, speeches, and I'm sure that will be interesting. El, el gran historiador Eric Hobsbawm inicia su celebrada autobiografía haciendo referencia a un conocido proverbio chino que dice ojalá vivas años interesantes. A pesar de la primera impresión, según los sinólogos, no habría que interpretar este proverbio como manifestación de buenos deseos, sino más bien como una maldición. Pues los tiempos suelen ser interesantes cuando en ellos se produce la quiebra del orden conocido y se abre un horizonte de cambios, rupturas e incertidumbres. En este sentido, Hobsbawm calificaba al siglo XX que le había tocado vivir como años interesantes. Estos últimos años del siglo XXI no alcanzan, desde luego, el nivel de transformaciones radicales del siglo XX, incluidas dos guerras mundiales devastadoras, pero tras los sucesos inéditos que hemos vivido, bien podemos calificarlos de tiempos interesantes en el sentido del proverbio. Nuestras democracias afrontan retos y amenazas que ponen en riesgo los presupuestos sobre los que se asientan. La desinformación, la, pol la polarización, los populismos, el impacto de la inteligencia artificial, todavía incierta, todavía por determinar, los ataques a la institucionalidad democrática. Ante todos estos retos, las democracias debemos reaccionar. Están en juego los valores europeos que nos identifican y que nos unen, que compartimos todos nosotros. Las armas de la democracia son el debate, la tolerancia y el respeto. Frente a la polarización necesitamos más tolerancia, no menos. Frente a la desinformación y los hechos alternativos necesitamos más libertad de expresión y mayor y mejor ejercicio periodístico y comunicativo, haciendo honor a la ofrecer información veraz a los ciudadanos, y no menos. 
Los medios de defensa de nuestra institucionalidad democrática apelan a la implicación de los ciudadanos. Ellos son los dueños de nuestro sistema de gobierno. En sus manos está su mejor defensa. Reforzar la conciencia del valor de la democracia y la necesidad de cuidarla es una tarea precisamente que corresponde a los parlamentos. Esta temática será la que abordaremos en esta sesión en la que contaremos con las intervenciones iniciales de diversos presidentes de parlamentos, miembros de, de la Unión Europea y a continuación evidentemente se abrirá para que todos los presentes puedan participar. En primer lugar, tengo el honor de darle la palabra a la presidenta de la Asamblea Nacional de Eslovenia, Ursa Klakokar Subansic, con la que tuve el placer, he, eh, he pronunciado fatal el nombre, eh, Urska Klakokar Zupancic. That's much better. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Y tuve ocasión de hacer una visita oficial a, a Eslovenia. Eh, tuve una acogida eh, cálida y, y con todo el cariño que me ofreció y que yo le agradezco. Y tiene un discurso muy interesante, muy inteligente. Tiene, es una persona muy formada y por tanto estoy segura que nos va a ofrecer a todos mucha luz sobre, sobre esta cuestión. Madam Speaker, what, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, dear President Batet Lamania and President Gil Garcia, distinguished fellow speakers and parliamentary colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. When President Batet invited me to deliver this address, I did not hesitate for a moment, as it was precisely my profound personal commitment to fundamental European values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law that made me decide to enter parliamentary politics. Over the past years, our societies have been confronted with a series of crises calling for a strengthened defense of our democracies and democratic institutions. One such crisis is the brutal invasion of Ukraine, an illegal military aggression by the autocratic Russian regime taking place at the very doorstep of our Union. Importantly, beyond generating significant geopolitical shifts in the short term, this crisis has, in the long term, put the questions of democracy and internal threats to democratic processes back high on the agenda of both international and national institutions. Turning a blind eye to illiberal and autocratic tendencies is no longer an option. In this whirlwind of changes, parliaments are called to re-establish themselves as centers of democratic legitimacy tasked with upholding the rule of law and the values contemporary Europe is built upon. Parliaments are representative institutions elected by the body politics to which they are accountable. When citizens feel their environment in governance, their involvement in governance is limited, their political disengagement becomes a cruel reality. Declining trends in voter turnout in many European countries are a telling indicator of disenchanted voters who feel unrepresented by their political leaders or their policies. In this regard, I am glad that the last Slovenian parliamentary election, the voter turnout was the highest in over 20 years. To sustain such trends, we are working hard to support a vibrant civil society and promote civic education that will equip citizens, particularly the youth, with the knowledge and skills required to participate in democratic processes. Our National exam Assembly, for example, is visited by several schools every week, giving young people the opportunity to experiment parliamentary work in person. Ladies and gentlemen, a thriving democracy also requires inclusive political dialogue, which in the era of modern technologies has come under significant threat. The use of social media and digital platforms by political actors does not live up to the promises of virtual democracy. Quite the contrary. Digital tools are often used by political opinion leaders as a means of spreading hate speech and misinformation. 
This fuels populism, drives polarization, breeds extremism, and makes misled citizens unknowingly contribute to perverted electoral processes, thereby corroding one of the most sacred democratic institutions, free and fair elections. A combination of such impacts may lead to instances of a complete breakdown of the social fabric, as we have seen in the attacks of the United States Capitol and the National Congress in Brasilia. As parliamentarians, we have a fundamental responsibility to act against all illiberal tendencies. Freedom of speech is a, valuable, is a value indispensable to European democracy. However, free speech ends the moment it infringes on the equal right of others to personal dignity and security, as consistently confirmed by the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Hate speech is a populist tool for gaining political power by driving wedges in our societies at the expense of selected scapegoats. We must abhor be behavior that promotes intolerance and exclusion. In parliamentary debates, we must strive for a high level of culture in dialogue by respecting the diversity of our opinions while at the same time condemning hateful and populistic rhetoric. Parliaments are places of critical and well-argued debate, not verbal slaughterhouses. Just like hate and intolerance, false news and misinformation are equally corrosive to democracy. COVID-19 conspiracy theories, disinformation campaigns surrounding the war in Ukraine, and false news perverting electoral processes worldwide are some of the striking examples of how misinformation represents the cancer of contemporary democracy. In a democratic society, informed citizens rely on accurate information to make rational decisions. Misinformation disrupts this process by distorting perceptions, manipulating emotions, and introducing false narratives. When individuals base their decisions on inaccurate information, democratic decision-making is compromised. Addressing the consequences of misinformation requires collective efforts with and beyond our borders. We must promote media and digital literacy, support critical thinking, and adopt legislation demanding transparent and ethical practices within media and technology platforms. We must stand firmly in support of independent journalism and free media, particularly free public media, which serve as watchdogs holding politicians accountable for their actions, thereby maintaining transparency and integrity within democratic systems. I hope that the European Media Freedom Act, once agreed upon, will help to secure our citizens' right to freedom of information as enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, democracy at home and abroad stands before a myriad of challenges, pandemics, wars, financial and economic breakdowns, and climate change are only a handful of exemplary crises that fuel the engines, of the engines of populism, intolerance, misinformation, and other threats disrupting democratic processes. I'm convinced that the topics we are discussing here today must trickle down to all levels of national parliamentarism as well as into interparliamentary cooperation. Threats to democracy are not to be taken lightly, nor should they be overgeneralized or oversimplified. Like any other fundamental value we hold dear, democracy should not be a scarce commodity, but rather flourish in abundance. Thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Muchas gracias, Presidenta Clacochar. A continuación, eh, voy a darle la palabra al presidente del Parlamento de Suecia, Riks Dagen, eh, cuyo nombre es Andreas Norlen, y a quien le quiero agradecer eh, públicamente, puesto que he tenido la oportunidad de hacerlo personalmente, eh, la generosidad que ha tenido de, alguna manera, eh, contribuir también a la celebración de esta conferencia a caballo entre la presidencia sueca y la presidencia española, puesto que hoy es el último día precisamente de, de la presidencia de, de su país. Creo que es una buena colaboración también entre, entre parlamentos eh, que compartimos o que sucedemos presidencias y, y espero que este ejemplo pues, también sirva a lo mejor 
para en un futuro establecer este tipo de colaboraciones entre eh, parlamentos en la dimensión parlamentaria de las presidencias del Consejo de la Unión Europea. Un placer tenerlo aquí y cederle la palabra, presidente Norlen. Madam President, uh, colleagues, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a great honor to be here in Lyon today to commemorate the International Day of Parliamentarism and to discuss challenges to our democracy. And I would like to congratulate the Spanish Parliament for organizing this important and interesting conference as the first activity of the parliamentary dimension of the Spanish presidency. And I was only too I was only too pleased to, to be able to contribute in this small way of granting an extra day to your parliamentary dimension uh, in this way, uh, because I think it is a wonderful and important initiative that you have taken. Um, so as we conclude the Swedish presidency, we look with great expectation to our, uh, the, the coming activities of our Spanish friends. Uh, and I think the start of the parliamentary dimension of the Spanish presidency here today is a, uh, something that really promises a great, uh, great activities to come also in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when speaking about the importance of democracy and the rule of law, we often talk in terms of legal and constitutional frameworks. And indeed, having solid frameworks uh, of this kind in place, creating predictability for the people, is essential. But that in itself is not enough. Uh, parliaments and parliamentarians play an important role as legislators, um, but as parliamentarians we have an equally important role in creating and upholding a democratic political culture. Sweden's constitutional laws and the laws which govern the work of the Riksdag of course contain the most central provisions of Sweden's form of government and the Riksdag and are crucial to democracy. They, however, rely on the assumption that members of government, of parliament, I and other officials will do what is expected of us. It is not enough that we simply follow the rules. We must also be loyal to the spirit of, the, of these rules, especially in areas which lack detailed regulation. We need a democratic political culture in order to ensure that everyone feels responsibility and loyalty towards the system in which we all work. Therefore, how we conduct, conduct ourselves as parliamentarians matters. Our judgment, for instance, regarding how we behave towards one another matters. I think we need to uphold democracy, cherish it, develop it, and defend it. Um, I had the privilege, before I became Speaker, of being Chair of the Committee on the Constitution of the Swedish Parliament. And it goes without saying that the members represented different political parties with different opinions. In spite of this, uh, the committee sought to put aside partisan differences to reach consensus in determining what was constitutionally correct and relevant, particularly when scrutinizing the government. In some cases, this required lively discussions, but the tone of these discussions was always respectful. His Majesty the King previously uh, spoke about uh, tolerance and the respect for difference, uh, the need to compromise and to reach agreements, and I think this goes to the core of what also I am trying to, to say here today. Um, because the goal of the committee was to reach a common understanding about the basic rules and principles of the political process, to ensure that governments are judged by the same standards regardless of their political culture. Uh, and I think it is important to have consensus on the political playbook uh, so that we can all agree how we should run our political systems. But to be clear, agreeing on the fundamental rules and principles regarding the operation of the political system does not mean a watered-down political discussion on the issues of the day, on the contrary. Such agreement makes it possible to focus on the issues instead of arguing about procedural matters or fighting about attempts to manipulate the system in order to gain benefits for a party or a government. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the Swedish constitution consists of four fundamental laws, and one of those is the Freedom of the Press Act from 1766. It gives the media the right to express freely, uh, and it gives all citizens the right to access official documents. Um, this act was the result of special political circumstances during uh, the Swedish Age of Liberty, as it's called in the history books of the 18th century. Um, and um, it was important uh, during this period uh, of time uh, to stress that um, the Riksdag then had vast powers and the king had very limited powers. Um, and it was considered very important to be able to freely exchange views and ideas. And this eventually led to the creation of this Freedom of the Press Act, which was the first law of its kind in the world. And this Freedom of the Press Act was recently added to UNESCO's Memory of the World Register. Another documentation that is part of the UNESCO Memory of the World Register is the impressive decrees of Lyon from 1188, the first documented example of parliamentarism in history. It is truly extraordinary that we have gathered here today from all over Europe and other parts of the world to commemorate this important uh, declaration that was written more than 800 years ago. The world was, of course, something different in 1188 than the world of today. But principles that have developed over the centuries, experiences that history has given us, and the knowledge of what shaped our countries are relevant even in our modern time. Um, returning to Sweden, returning to Sweden um, let me mention that Sweden as a country began to emerge some 1,000 years ago, but on the 6th of June 1523, a new king was elected, Gustav Vasa. And following his election, Sweden left the Kalmar Union with Denmark and Norway and embarked on a new path as a once again fully independent country. And the Riksdag is thus this year commemorating and celebrating how Sweden's formal government has developed with a particular emphasis on the role of the parliament and the development of its work procedures over the past 500 years. I think it is important to use jubilees such as this to remember and learn about our past but also to talk about today and tomorrow. Because I think we need to constantly communicate with the citizens of our countries on the emergence of democracy and why democracy is crucial to our societies today and tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, today Sweden is holding the rotating presidency of the Council of the European Union for the last day. Uh, this also means, as we as I mentioned before, that the Riksdag uh, today, for the, for the last day, is uh, leading the EU, the parliamentary dimension of the EU presidency. To summarize, uh, this spring, the Riksdag has organized eight interparliamentary conference, conferences in which members and officials from the national parliaments and the European Parliament have participated. In total, we have welcomed around 600 parliamentarians to the Riksdag for discussions on topics such as circular bioeconomy, organized crime, Russia's war against Ukraine, the EU's future energy supply, and democracy in Europe. Uh, now I'm pleased to officially hand over the parliamentary dimension of the presidency to our Spanish colleagues. I wish you all the best of luck with this important, challenging, but also fun task. A task which is truly about developing and strengthening democracy in the Member States and in our European Union. For that reason, I think it is of great symbolic significance that we have gathered in this beautiful city to commemorate the history of parliaments and at the same time start the next phase in the development of the parliamentary cooperation in Europe. The Spanish Parliament's leadership of the parliamentary dimension of the presidency of the European Union. Best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. President Norland. A continuación, voy a dar la palabra al presidente de la Asamblea de la República de Portugal, don Augusto Ernesto Santos Silva, profesor de universidad con el que tuve el placer 
de mantener eh, un debate abierto a los alumnos en una eh, universidad portuguesa y también, eh, además de político, hombre de reflexión, hombre de pensamiento y, por tanto, especialmente adecuado para, para esta mesa redonda. Presidente. Gracias. I will say the first three sentences in Spanish and then I will move to uh, English. Solo para te agradecer, querida Marichal, la invitación para estar acá con, con vosotros y para desear todos los éxitos a la presidencia española de la Unión Europea. Y para te felicitar también por esta involucración con la dimensión parlamentaria de la presidencia europea. I think that uh, we, we can say and we must say that uh, currently European uh, values and uh, uh, democratic institutions are under several threats. And we can distinguish between uh, external factors and internal factors concerning those uh, threats. Uh, uh, democracy in Europe is coming under threat from outside it, from authoritarian regimes and their advocates inside our parliament, as well as from uh, extremist and violent ideologies and from several non-state actors like, uh, for instance, uh, human trafficking groups, private armies, or uh, cyber hackers and attackers. But I think we also need to recognize that some internal factors, internal to the functioning of our democracies, are weakening our democracies. And I would like to contribute to our debate focusing on these internal factors factors that are internal to the way in which our institutions, our democratic institutions, relate themselves with public and function themselves on uh, their everyday life. And uh, I think three questions, at least three questions, we need to address. What are we doing that favors the rise of discontentment towards democracy and elected officials among our citizens? What can we do and we must do to help the improvement among our citizenship of democratic sentiment and public trust in parliaments and governments? And how can we How can we improve the resilience of democratic institutions within the European Union? I think that we can and uh, we must address at least these uh, three questions. And I would like to express in a very humble way four elements of what would be my personal response to this questions. First, I think we must acknowledge a certain entropy of institutions. We can see it in lower efficiency, short-term politics, politics that predominates the hegemony of short-term policies, and less autonomy we can see among public powers towards the media agenda or even private interests. To counter this trend that weakens our democracy, I think that we need to focus on public policies that respond to social needs and expectations of our citizens. This is really, I think, very important. We have to draw some lessons from our recent past. The imposition following the sovereign debt uh, crisis in uh, 2010, the imposition of orthodox austerity measures caused in many countries, for instance Portugal, 
a massive disaffiliation of citizens vis-à-vis -vis government and elected officials. On the contrary, the way in which we, the Europeans, addressed the pandemic and the economic consequences of the pandemic and the way in which we established a very powerful mechanism to support and to improve our resilience and to accelerate our economic recovery post-pandemic helped, helped strongly to improve the democratic sentiment and public trust in ourselves in the politicians and the political institutions. So I think we must draw some lessons from our past, uh, recent past, and we must maintain this focus. Public policies are meant to respond to social needs and social expectations of people. We need to modernize our party system. And I'm thinking namely of the moderate parties, the parties that occupy the center of the uh, party system in European democracies. We need to modernize our parties, both ideologically and in what regards the way they relate to their electorate and to voters in general, so what, in what regards their proximity to citizens mainly citizens that are now feeling that they are uh, in the margins of the social system, that they are relegated to a sort of social periphery. We have to reconquer these citizens because the way populists are acting is specially targeting these citizens that think of themselves as victims of globalization or of modernization. So I do think that uh, we need to give other focus to public policies, meaning a set of measures responding to social needs of the several groups of our electorate and society. Secondly, I think that we need to take seriously, more seriously, the issues of transparency, accountability, and fight against corruption within our democratic regimes. I will not elaborate on this point, since Professor Keane has already presented us with very insightful uh, thoughts on this issue. But this is really a issue, an issue for all of us, not only for the Global South, not only for Latin American countries, but also to European Union member states. Um, third, I think that we have to change our working methods and our communication strategy. They are becoming obsolete. Some of them are already obsolete, out of time. We need to take full benefit from uh, ICTs and digital means and digital media. They are not our enemies. They are means that we have to use to come closer to uh, public opinion and to citizens and to the different groups that form our open societies. And we need to modernize public communication the public communication of our institutions are not that much in favor of uh, getting the attention and the involvement of citizens, namely of young citizens. And finally, I think that uh, we still think in terms of the most Second World War consensus in Europe regarding the achievements and the foundations of democracy. We do it rightly.
but we have to add something else to this post-war consensus, namely between liberals, social democrats and Christian democrats in Europe. We need an orientation towards the future. It is not enough to celebrate the past achievements, to celebrate Europe as Europe is, the, the best combina combination ever of uh, liberal democracies, um, economic growth and social cohesion. We need to add to this awareness of our achievements an orientation towards future. And in my view, this means two things particularly. First, we have to not to talk to the youth, but to listen to the youngsters. And we, in order to listen to them, we have to accept their own terms of reference. And on the other side, I think we, uh, the liberal democracy must recognize the new ways people are using to form, to perform their citizenship, their social activism, and their political engagement. Of course, representative democracy is the, at the heart of the open societies, of a liberal democracy, but it can dialogue and it can incorporate new forms of doing politics that are not, again, similar to the old conventional ways of doing politics and to decide policies in post-war Europe. So this orientation towards the future, uh, I think, is one of the best remedies we have to fight populism and to reconquer our electorate. Thank you. Obrigada, Presidente Santos. Finalmente, voy a dar la palabra al Presidente del Parlamento de Croacia, Don Gordon Chandrokovic. Uh, I think I pronounce, porque como tienen jugadores de fútbol, eh, estamos más familiarizados a lo mejor con eh, la pronunciación de los apellidos eh, croatas. Eh, con él he mantenido durante esta legislatura una experiencia muy interesante. Hemos celebrado por primera vez un foro entre, entre ambos países de alto contenido en el que fuimos capaces de llegar a una resolución y a unas conclusiones muy interesantes y espero que la profundización de estas relaciones pues, se pueda mantener con Croacia y con el resto de Estados miembros porque creo que es muy importante, como decía al principio, que esta dimensión parlamentaria esté siempre vigorosa y que sea un buen acompañamiento también a los acuerdos que nuestros gobiernos eh, alcanzan. Así es que, presidente, tiene la palabra. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Dear Mary Chell, first allow me to thank you for bringing us all here to the amazing city of Leon, the cradle of parliamentarism, and thank you for excellent organization and warm hospitality. Dear colleagues, I followed all the speeches with great interest. They confirmed to me that we are largely preoccupied by the same issues. And today's International Day of Parliamentarism is a most welcome opportunity to jointly reflect on how we, as parliamentarians, can make our democratic institutions more resilient, how we can preserve fundamental EU values, and how we can reverse the negative trends we observe. Yes, we see the democratic values and norms are very seriously challenged in many countries, within our own borders, in our neighborhoods, and across the world. We observe a growing lack of our citizens' trust in our democratic institutions, and thereby in parliamentary democracy itself. We see information manipulation campaigns, foreign interference into elections, fake news, and a wide range of other malign cyber and hybrid activities. 
We also note the potential for misuse of artificial intelligence. All this is very clearly aimed at destabilizing our societies and endangering our values. And this has indeed become the global new normal. It leaves neither politicians nor voters immune. Our democratic processes are becoming more and more fragile. The risks keep growing. This calls for prompt actions, for increased and continuous vigilance to threats and negative trends, for improving and widening the range of our specific and concrete countermeasures. Various malign actors show no hesitation in interfering or destabilizing us. So we must display equal decisiveness in our joint responses, equal at least, including at the parliamentary level. Our reactions must be marked by innovation and efficiency in the speed of recognizing threats, in the speed of decision-making, and in the speed of action. Furthermore, we must be able to quickly adapt, and in parallel, we need to continue working on strengthening our mutual cooperation. I am sure its full potential at interparliamentary level remains yet to be unlocked. Ladies and gentlemen, while appreciating all our democratic achievements and standards, we do realize that nowadays none of this can be taken for granted. Faced with multiple consequences of Russia's cruel and vicious aggression on Ukraine, the world is becoming increasingly polarized. And Europe is rightfully attempting to achieve more resilience and more strategic autonomy in many critical sectors in energy, food, health, climate, security, and defense. But make no mistake, democracy itself is one of these critical sectors. And it is equally, if not more, exposed and vulnerable to various influences and threats, both external and internal. Dear colleagues, in our national political arenas, I think most of us observe similar patterns the rise of populism, of radical and extremist ideas, both to the left and to the right of the political spectrum. I believe it is our obligation to do all we can to help our citizens recognize the shallow criticism which usually offers no solution, to help them see the difference between responsible and irresponsible policies and politicians to help them appreciate the political approach that focuses on concrete and sustainable measures for our societies and economies, rather than false and un unachievable promises. Because we have chosen long ago to build rather than to deconstruct, to value compromise rather than division, because this is the European way. But today it seems that we need to remind the public again of the foundations Europe was built upon. Remind them of what made Europe a place of freedom and peace, of effective pluralism and democracy, protection of human rights and freedoms, rule of law, and much more. This is no small feat by any standard, so we need to communicate that more, uh, that more frequently and more consistently perhaps with the same passion that our values are often attacked with. Fellow parliamentarians, the word democracy deserves to always be written by a capital D. This carries an important symbolic message. But let's never forget the demo, demos in the key part of the word. Yes, the people, our citizens are key indeed and safeguarding democracies also means protecting our citizens. So to counter the destructive influences they are exposed to, we need to concretely step up our efforts towards them by communicating our policies more directly and more clearly in a common dialogue that is not restricted to electoral cycles only, by helping strengthen their media and digital literacy and providing education towards critical thinking and resilience to disinformation. We need to develop mechanisms that provide more transparency of information and ensure more information integrity. 
We need to make sure that actual uncorrupted truth reaches our public. Actions in this sense would surely enable our citizens to make better informed decisions, making them much more resilient as, uh, as voters too. By doing all this, we are clearly investing into our democracies. Dear colleagues, at the same time, we must bear in mind that democracy is not given. It really needs constant care, investment, and when necessary, adjustment. Croatia is living proof that an effective adaptation is very much possible, however demanding it may be. Tomorrow, Croatia proudly marks its first 10 years of EU membership. During this time, we successfully transformed our society and made Croatia a more resilient country. This shows that with clear goals and the right amount of political will, significant leaps forward can indeed be achieved for the benefit of our citizens. That kind of will is a key precondition for the efforts that all of us need to continue investing into safeguarding and strengthening our democratic institutions and into increasing their functionality and their readiness for new challenges. This is a worthy and by no means easy goal, but much more importantly, it is an achievable one, and it is our duty as parliamentarians to spare no efforts in reaching it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Seguidamente procederé a dar la palabra a los distintos participantes que lo han solicitado. Eh, en primer lugar, eh, al señor Mikhail Popchoy, vicepresidente del Parlamento de la República de Moldavia. Your Excellencies, it is highly symbolic that we meet today in the cradle of European and global democracy and parliamentarism. And it is equally important that we address today the main threat to the rules and values that we hold so dear. Because make no mistake, our friends in Ukraine are fighting not just for the future of their children, for the sovereignty of their land, but they are fighting to defend the values enshrined in the Cortes de Leon, in the Magna Carta, in the Human Rights Declaration, in their Helsinki Charter, and finally in the rules-based order, which is at the core of the European process and at the core of the peace in Europe that we also cherish. So it is important that we remain united and we show solidarity until Ukraine ends up victorious. And Moldova is doing its contribution, having welcomed a million refugees in a country of two and a half million, and doing its utmost to combat Russian hybrid threats, boosting its energy security to no longer be dependent on Russian gas and electricity, but most of all, the Republic of Moldova is reforming itself to be closer to all those European values that we hold so dear. Despite the many challenges, we are implementing robust anti-corruption reforms, boosting the, uh, the independence of the judiciary. Last year, we improved 60 positions in the Reporters Without Borders ranking of freedom of the media, being ranked 28th in the world. We are ranked better than most countries in Europe when it comes to gender equality, having 40% of women in Parliament. And this year we hope that we can start negotiations of accession to the European Union so that we can anchor ourselves onto the European democratic project and turn the page on our troubled past of Soviet and Russian imperial and Russian neo-imperial present. So, to paraphrase uh, Martin Luther King, the arc of moral history is long, but it bends towards democracy. But it only does so if we work together and we defend it every single day. 
So a robust sanctioning mechanism against those that are undermining democracy is very important. A sanctioning mechanism against oligarchs that are undermining the livelihood of so many citizens. A sanctioning mechanism and a mechanism of combating money laundering and the recovery of stolen assets that is very important to countries like Moldova. So I'd like to thank you all for your commitment to parliamentarism and democracy, and I can only reassure you that Moldova is a strong ally and partner in this process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice President. Yes. Voy a dar la palabra a continuación al Presidente de la Asamblea Nacional de la República de Bulgaria, Don Rosen Jeliashkov. Parece que no se encuentra en la sala. Tiene la palabra doña Gabriela Moravska Staneka, Deputy Speaker of the Senate of the Republic of Poland. Thank you. Señorías, desde hace varios años ya democracia está sometida a duras pruebas en Europa y en el mundo. Tras la caída del telón de acero, todos tendíamos a pensar que la era de guerra fría y de confrontación había irrevocablemente terminado y nunca volvería, y que los Estados y las naciones iban a cooperar armoniosamente resolviendo problemas comunes. Sin embargo, la crisis económica de 2008 y la política de austeridad, así como finalmente la crisis migratoria de 2015, en varios estados habían generado problemas que han sido utilizados por las fuerzas que no respetan los principios de separación de poderes y la democracia. Hay movimientos políticos en Europa que están librando una guerra híbrida contra la democracia por estar, no obstante las malentendidas, ideas patrióticas y soberanistas, impregnados por un modo de pensar autoritario, herencia de la época histórica anterior. Al fin y al cabo dicen abiertamente que quieren una democracia liberal. Por eso, la democracia en la Unión Europea exige protección y apoyo constante. Los gobiernos que pisotean los valores comunitarios fundamentales recogidos en el artículo 2 del tratado, lo hacen el principio impunemente a pesar de las numerosas resoluciones del Parlamento Europeo, del Consejo de Europa y varios procedimientos de incumplimiento de las obligaciones del Estado miembro y de los fallos del Tribunal de Justicia, como también la activación sin precedentes del llamado procedimiento del artículo 7 del Tratado. Señorías, debemos decirle claramente la Unión Europea no es únicamente la organización para la cooperación económica, es algo más que una unión aduanera. Los derechos fundamentales, la dignidad de ser humano y el Estado de Derecho deben respetarse porque la Unión Europea no es un cajero automático. Cada día debemos luchar por la, por la democracia y no tratarla como algo ganado para siempre, para preservar los cuatro pilares del Estado de Derecho, o sea, el poder judicial, el marco anticorrupción, el pluralismo de los medios de comunicación, así como los mecanismos de control y equilibrio, debemos mejorar los procedimientos existentes de protección del Estado de Derecho. Señorías, una muy amenaza importante para la democracia y a escala global es el cambio climático, evidente sobre todo aquí, en España, país que se enfrenta a las sequías y deser desertización. El cambio climático genera enormes costes para nuestras economías y sociedades. La lucha contra el cambio climático debe ser una prioridad para todos nosotros, respeto y un compromiso con nuestros hijos, para quienes el cuidado por el clima es una prioridad. Debemos recordar que una de las principales causas de la migración hacia Europa de los territorios del África subsahariana son las condiciones climáticas, la falta de agua 
y los conflictos que hacen que la vida ahí se vuelva extremadamente difícil. Por eso, los migrantes climáticos superan todos los obstáculos, mar, muros y barreras para llegar a Europa arriesgando su salud y su vida. Europa no puede convertirse en una fortaleza. Europa debe crear por fin su política de asilo y migración porque lo que está haciendo hasta ahora es solo reaccionar a las sucesivas crisis migratorias convirtiéndose en rehén de los dictadores y haciendo difíciles compromisos en materia de los derechos humanos. Es un reto que requiere decisiones políticas audaces. Para muchos demagogos, los migrantes son un chivo expiatorio de ensueño que puede al mismo tiempo servir para asustar a la sociedad en tiempos de incertidumbre. Debemos, sin embargo, oponernos al populismo y al discurso de odio. Gracias por su atención. Muchas, muchas gracias, querida vicepresidenta, querida Gabriela. Ahora ha sí sido la palabra al presidente de la Asamblea Nacional de la República de Bulgaria, don Rosen Jeliashkov. Muchísimas gracias, excelentísima señora Presidente del Congreso de los Diputados. Estimados presidentes de parlamentos, estimados colegas y amigos, estoy muy tentado de seguir en español, pero nuestra diversidad lingüística me obliga a cambiar al búlgaro. Escapi, colegita, Zigudina, Mejunarodniot Booker, Enaut Nai Stoinusnite, y желани световни литературни награди бе присъден на българския писател Георги Господинов за романа му Време убежище. В това забележително произведение се описва един свят потънов несигурно настояще и изправен пред едно евентуално опустошително бъдеще, в който е изкушен да повтори грешките на отминалите времена. Колкото повече едно общество забравя, толкова повече някой произвежда, продава и запълва сърза в памет освободените ниши, пише господинов. И предупреждава, след диктатурата на бъдещето, идва диктатурата на миналото. Позволявам си тази аналогия с литературата, защото съм убеден, че защитата на европейските ценности и заплахите за демокрацията имат много силна връзка с темата за памета с колективната историческа памет, а памета в много голяма степен определя нашето поведение с настоящето и нашите бъдещи действия, как и съхраняваме, как и осмисляме, как и предаваме на поколенията и как образуваме с нея. След беженската иммиграционна криза, Брекзит и кризата с COVID, сега сме изправени пред нова ужасяваща заплаха – война на нашия континент, която е не само атака срещу демократична и суверенна Украина, но и срещу демокрацията като цяло. Свидетели сме на една опасна дезинформационна война, която се води във връзка с военните действия в Украина. Едно от най-сериозните изпитания за европейските ценности днес е именно за страшителните измерения на дезинформацията. Дезинформацията трови обществения дебат, променя демократичния разговор и подхранва реални вътрешни заплахи за демокрацията. Национализъм, изолационизъм, популизъм, крайната поляризация и проявите на авторитаризъм. Уважаеми колеги! Силните парламенти са в основата на всяка демокрация. Като единствените институции, прако избрани от народа, те разполагат с широк инструментариум за въздействие и защита на европейските ценности. От законодателни политики до ползотворно взаимодействие с структурите на гражданското общество. Необходими са редица действия от наша страна. Необходима една още по-решителна подкрепа за стабилността на нашите партньорски държави от региона на Черно море и Западните Балкани, които са най-уязвими от руското влияние и хибридни дейности. Необходима е целенасочена институционална подкрепа за социалните мрежи, комуникационните канали и публичните информационни ресурси, които създават среда на толерантно, информирано и идеологическо необремене на общуване. На всички нас, скъпи колеги и приятели, е известно, че поколението на днешните деца и младежи живее почти изцяло в дигиталния свят. 
Прозрактът не завърши именно с посланието, че това обстоятелство трябва да бъде оползотворено като шанс да подкрепим младите европейци и да им осигурим необходимите условия те да издраснат като личности, свободни от предразсъдъците на културната изолация, ксенофобията и шовинизма, но богати с свободни и лесен достъп до постиженията на европейската цивилизация. И ал финал десея ун гран ексито ала президенция спаньола дел Консехо де ла Унион Европея. Мучисам грасиас. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Voy a dar eh, una palabra más y luego preguntaré a la mesa si algún miembro quiere reaccionar o, o comentar, hacer alguna reflexión adicional. Tiene la palabra el señor Andrés Grifroy, first vice speaker of the Belgian Senate. Your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first thank to the organization for this uh, wonderful day here together in Lyon. And we heard today that our parliamentary democracy is in danger, and this for many reasons, like extremism, war, influence, lobbying, etc. And to be clear, this is true. But from my different roles, I have the opportunity, when it comes to the democracy, the parliamentary democracy, to experience what works and what doesn't work. One of the solutions is multi-level governance. Parliaments must take more into account the needs of lower decision-making authorities, such as regional and local authorities, when voting laws and making decisions. In practice, local authorities are confronted with climate change, digitalization, poverty, media, and are looking for concrete measures. And the solution to many of these problems often lies locally, but they are usually do not have the, tool, the tools to solve this. And this is because higher levels of decision-making make decisions that are sometimes counterproductive to solve a local problem. And the question is, how do we solve this? How do we make sure that, on one hand, a global objective and global monitoring are still taken into account and, on the other hand, the policies do not interfere too much with the practical implementation at lower levels. A good example is climate. The Paris Agreement has a global objective. And Europe has translated this, this into a Green Deal with certain objectives for less emissions, more renewable energy, and has drawn up plans for adaptation. And the overall European objective as part of the Paris Agreement is then translated into objectives for each country. And this can be different depending on variety of factors, degree of industrialization, population density, economic prosperity, poverty, social factors, and so on. And in turn, each country has to translate this into a national energy and climate plan. And some European countries have assigned climate competence to the regions, others have not. Others try to draw up global national action plans or seek cooperation with local authorities. But if there is not enough sufficient participation, people feel less involved. Concrete action measures fall through and the overall objective is not achieved. So in order to achieve the global objective at the national or regional level, it's very useful to establish a stakeholder platform where one can discuss with the different actors the objectives to be achieved and which action measures can be taken in return. And these concrete measures must be simple, tangible, affordable and very easy to monitor. And for example, in Flanders, in region in the north of Belgium, the Parliament has tried to take these concerns into account by implementing local climate plans. And we can already see the success of this approach, as almost all municipalities and cities are participating and also achieving results. And this proves that stakeholder consultation is useful. Establishing this type of consultation means that no laws can be voted on without first consulting the various stakeholders. And this may lengthen the process of decision. Yes, that's true, but it does also guarantee that the final laws and decisions will be more supported. And creating a support base means creating a support base means more and a better outcome and society. And that's what democracy is ultimately about. That's essentially the task of a parliament,
to ensure through a democratic way that everyone is on board. Whether it's about climate or digitalization or poverty policy, the multi-level governance is the key to better parliamentary democracy. Thank you. Muchas gracias, vicepresidente. Primero, tiene la palabra a continuación el señor Svein Harberg, first vice president of the Norwegian Parliament. Thank you, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me to speak to you in a city where the first example of parliamentarianism was written more than 800 years ago. In recent years, the number of countries moving in an authoritarian direction has been twice as high as the number of those moving towards democracy. The decline of, in democracy is greater in Europe than in any other region of the world. The wave of freedom in the wake of 1989 has not just faded out. In some place it, places it has even been pushed back. What's more, the democratic path of one country is sometimes the source of a brutal invasion by another, as we are witnessing in Ukraine today. Their role, Putin's war of aggression, is a stark reminder of what may happen in a country when leaders systematically set aside democratic principles. Ukraine is fighting for its freedom, but the Ukrainians are also fighting for a free Europe, for a Europe where relations between states are regulated by law, for a Europe defended defined by democracy and human rights. Societies based on these values serve everyone well. Societies based on these values are more resilient, more attractive to everyone. Let me also stress the vital role that the young generation plays in maintaining a resilient democratic society. As politicians, we have a distinct responsibility to include and engage young people in politics. Dear friends, the war in Ukraine has shown us Europe's dark side, but there are also many glimmers of light. NATO is united. The EU is united. Though we are not an EU member, Norway is a part of the European partnership. We have committed ourselves to a long-term engagement in support of Ukraine, and we stand firmly together with our European partners and friends in defending our common values. This is more important that, than ever. Thank you. Muchas gracias, vicepresidente. Primero. Tiene la palabra ahora la señora Elvira Kovacs, Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly of the Republic of Serbia. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speakers of Parliament, Your Excellencies, distinguished colleagues. We live in the world which is democratic in principle, but there is still room for improvement and implementation of deeper and essential reforms in the society. Every country needs European values if it wishes to have a modern, stable and developed society. We cherish European values as a part of universal values that are focused on the well-being of an individual and on the right to life as a fundamental right of all of us. The Republic of Serbia is investing efforts on a daily basis and strives to cherish European values not only to become a part of the EU, but because we believe this is good for us. The return to Europe and European values is more important today than ever, and we support the European Union campaign, We Are Better Together. We expect the European Union to remain a credible partner that will enable the region to progress more quickly and effectively by using various mechanisms of engagement and presence in the region, including financial support. 
Multi-annual experience and best practices have proved that major areas of parliamentary work that serve to strengthen the democratic nature of institutions relate to harmonization of the national legislation with the key, monitoring and oversight through regular reports submitted by competent institutions, interparliamentary cooperation, and promotion of rights and obligations arising from the EU accession, and to the promotion of basic European values. Citizens of Serbia primarily associate the European Union with positive examples. In the first place, for them it represents the possibility of free travel within member states, then more employment opportunities and the path to a better future for the young. The assessment of the economic, political, security and other benefits of the EU membership greatly affect citizens' attitudes toward joining the EU. For this reason, it is very important to talk to citizens about the benefits of EU membership. It is important not to forget that the European integration process does not require only the efforts of candidate countries, but of the Union as well. This is why we deem it important that the EU and all its institutions should work towards enhancing the enlargement policy as the EU's competences cannot be achieved, um, completeness cannot be achieved without the Western Balkans. On the other hand, the EU should strengthen the credibility of the enlargement process. In order to make the accession process more credible for candidate countries, the EU should address more openly the issue of enlargement in the member states themselves, particularly in those member states where the public does not support the EU's enlargement policy. Uh, a combination of the credible perspective of membership and assistance to candidate countries is necessary for the successful overall integration capacity of the EU. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Voy a preguntar al, al Presidente Santos si quiere añadir alguna reflexión. Sí, muchas gracias. Solo muy brevemente para subrayar tres ideas que me parece muy importantes. La primera idea es la necesidad de defender todos los días la institucionalidad democrática. La única manera de combatir los extremismos y de prevenir los populismos es de profundizar la democracia, eh, defender las instituciones y promover la calidad democrática de nuestros regímenes. La segunda idea es la necesidad de comunicar todos los días también con la ciudadanía. La ciudadanía es la base de un régimen democrático y con la ciudadanía y todos los grupos que la constituyen es necesario que sus representantes tengan una comunicación simple, clara, directa y eh, cotidiana. Y la eh, tercera idea, eh, por fin, es la, la, la ventaja, ventaja, no, eh, es el hecho de que podemos y debemos utilizar una multiplicidad de una pluralidad de formas, de niveles para la concretización de las políticas públicas, regional, local, nacional, europeo, internacional, pero también la diversidad de las formas de participación y de comunicación ciudadana. Estas tres ideas me parecen ser un resultado muy importante de esta sesión. Gracias, Presidenta. Muchas gracias, Presidente Santos. Presidente Norlen. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, many interesting uh, contributions have been given here today. Uh, just a couple of comments on um, uh, a couple of items. Um, one is that I think in, uh, I mean, we all strive to improve our democratic systems. And I think we're all in favor of citizen participation in politics and that it is uh, vital to our democracies that we have uh, citizens uh, throughout our countries who care about what we do and who, who care about what we do and who take part in political discussions. What I do think we have to discuss more is uh, the tension that I think may be there between representative democracy and uh, new forms of citizen participation. 
because I, I have observed that there seems to be a trend uh, in, in some parts of Europe to uh, have systems where the institutions of, for instance, parliaments or governments uh, interact directly with citizens, uh, be it um, randomly selected groups of citizens or citizens who, who volunteer to take part in discussions. And I, uh, I think, uh, and I think the Conference on the Future of Europe also had, had uh, ideas of this kind. And uh, I, I think we have to be very careful when, when, if we want to create schemes like this, because um, at the heart of representative democracy, in, to my mind, are the political parties. Uh, to my mind, it's primarily the political parties who should interact directly with citizens, not political institutions like parliaments. Uh, because it is the political parties who should interact with citizens, listen to them, uh, recruit them as activists, uh, politicians in the future. And if we if we have institutions circumventing the political parties uh, in that process, I think that is uh, not necessarily a good thing, but can rather lead to very negative consequences. You, you disincentive citizens to become active in political parties and thereby limit, or, uh, limit the number of people who are uh, there to take on democratic, um, democratic tasks or to be uh, local, regional or national Euro or European politicians in the future. Uh, and I think we should be very careful before doing, doing that. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I'm uh, of course very open for, for um, including stakeholders in society in all kinds of processes. In Sweden there is, a, for instance, a constitutional obligation that the government or the parliament acting in the legislative process should consult with stakeholders, authorities, trade unions, uh, employers, organizations, or whomever might be affected by an, an, a draft legislation. And that, I think, is very important. And one final point. Uh, I, I didn't mention or I didn't address Russia's war against Ukraine uh, so much in my speech because I focused on other issues. But I, I want to agree with everyone who has mentioned this war here today and saying that I, too, uh, feel that this is is the, war, the, 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 um, the moment of our generation, of our political generation, when the future uh, of Europe is really formed. Because if we let Russia uh, gain anything from this brutal war, uh, we will create a Europe uh, which is thrown back into 19th century uh, great power politics, where the power lies in, in, in guns, not in words. And that would be uh, an assault on all of us and on the whole idea of a democratically, uh, on the democratic Europe. So uh, I think we should not be mistaken what is at stake here. This is not only about Ukraine. This is about uh, the future of all of us and the future of the entire continent. And I think that is very important to underscore. Thank you. Thank you. Voy a dar la palabra a los tres últimos oradores que tengo apuntados y luego preguntaré si hay alguien más interesado. A continuación tiene la palabra el señor Talat Shaferi, President of the Assembly of the Republic of North Macedonia. Дозволите ми да изразам особено задоволство, што денес повторно се среќаваме за да го одбележиме Меѓународниот ден на парламентаризмот во Леон, првиот документиран пример за парламентаризм во историјата. Форматот на денешната конференција во рамките на Шпанското председателство со Советот на Европската унија е јасен показател за обединатоста на земјето од Европа во одбраната на демократските вредности. Но морам да го изразам моето жалење што денес во 21-от век наместо да зборуваме за горливи за горливи проблеми кои се резултат на глобализацијата и миграцијските процеси и досега беа главна преокупација на нашите граѓани ние денес упатуваме порак и апел за заштита и зачувување на територијалните интегритет и суверенитет почитување на меѓународно признатите граници заштита од напад на нашите институции, 
Почитување на правото на самопределување, правото на говор и слободата на изразување, како и правото на пристап до објективни информации. Денес, која повеќе од една година сме сведоци за, брутал, за бруталната агресија на Руската Федерација врз Украина и непоколебливата борба на украинскиот народ, на украинските политичари за победа на демократијата и пошироко, на мултилатерализмот онаков како сме го прифатиле пред многу децении, Мора да признаеме дека актуелно поделениот свет бара од нас како представници на народа делуваме поодлучно во заедничките напори за одржливост на нашите либерални демократии. Како одговорни политичари и длабоко убедени хуманисти, не смееме да дозволиме идните генерации да живеат во свет кој ги игнорира и задушува договорните универзални права и вредности и свет во кој доминира апсолутизмот. Правот на силата и едностранното информирање на јавност. Ваквите ново креирани системи на власт, кои протежираат селективно перцепирање демократија, немаат место во современиот свет и истите налагаат наш силен и истраен одговор, со кој јасно ќе демонстрираме дека нивното прифаќање како демократски држави во мултилатералната рамка во целост ќе биде можно во оној момент кога тие се обврзат да ги почитуваат тие општо прифатени права и вредности. Почитувани колеги, парламентите се носители на спроведувањето на демократијата во својата основна форма, преку обезведување транспарентност и отчетност пред граѓаните за својата работа и преку ефективно представување на нивните интереси во процесот на денесување на одлуки. Република Северна Македонија, која има кандидатски статус за членство од 2005 година, и земја која треба да ги отвори поглавијата за преговори како последна фаза од процесот на пристапување во Европска унија, вклучително и ние како собранија, континуирано работиме и покрај сите бариери во изминатите децении на исполнување на Копенхашките критериуми за унапредување на нашиот евроинтегративен пат. Доказ за доследното почитување на европските вредности е нашата целосна усогласена со заедничката надворешна и безбедностна политика на Европска унија, вклучително и со рестриктивните мерки кон Руската Федерација. Во однос на законодавството на Европската унија, кое до сега го донесовме во собранието, оценките се дека земјата има значителен степен на усогласеност и истио треба да продолжи понатаму со отпарањето на преговарачките поглавја. Почитувани представници од земјите членки на Европска унија и Европскиот парламент. Апелирам со оглед на променетата геополитичка состојба во Европа да се одржи моментумот и, на, и динамиката на процес на проширување, особено во поглед на, пред, на предвиденото членство на Република Северна Македонија во Европската унија до 2030 година како реална цел, но и на останатите земји од регионот кои ќе ги исполнат критериумите за членство. Во спротивно, Ризикуваме посакуваната победа и заштитата на европските вродности кои се негуваат повеќе од 70 години на нашиот континент да бидат сериозно загрозени од трети центри на моќ. На крајот, би сакал да им честитам на домаќините за успешното организирање на оваа конференција. Ви благодарам на вниманието. Мучас грацијас, президенте. Tiene ahora la palabra el señor Stefan Musoyu. Yes, he's right. Thank you very much. Thank you. The chairperson of the Committee on European Affairs of the Chamber of Deputies of Romania. Thank you, the Honorable Speaker, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to address you today on the occasion, occasion of the uh, International Day of Parliamentarism here in León. First of all, I would like to congratulate the Spanish Parliament for organizing this event in a representative place for uh, parliaments, actually the cradle of uh, uh, parliamentarism. The consolidation of democracy and democratic uh, values are vital in our uh, European model, especially given the prevailing geopolitical uh, uh, challenges. The Russian Federation's brutal uh, aggression against Ukraine is also an uh, unprecedented attack of our principle and values. Facing this crisis, our citizens have been confronted uh, with hate speech, 
disinformation and foreign uh, interference which have acted as, catalyst, uh, as a catalyst for this crisis. For these reasons, there is a need for a strong response from states to find the best ways and develop tools to strengthen and defend democratic values, reconnect with our citizens and promote civil society engagement. As regards the rule of law, the EU has in recent years developed uh, its dedicated toolbox and capacity to act in this area. They are uh, an obligatory component of effective uh, national parliaments working to strengthen democratic institutions and principles. In the process of identifying solutions to the challenges uh, faced by all EU member states, it is essential to promote the exchange of national experiences and best practices. Nevertheless, we welcome uh, the constant dialogue on these uh, issues between the European institutions uh, and the national parliaments of EU member states. This dialogue contributes substantially to the shaping of a genuine culture of the rule of law uh, in the EU. Let us stand together in defense of uh, democratic uh, principles, fostering understanding, unity and uh, respect among all European citizens. By preserving and promoting our democratic uh, European values, we can build a, bright, a brighter future for ourselves and the generation to come. Thank you for your attention. Muchísimas gracias, Presidente. Tiene la palabra finalmente el señor Niels Fleming Hansen, the chairman of the European Affairs Committee of Denmark. Thank you very much. Dear fellow uh, parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, today we gather here to celebrate the International Day of Parliamentarism, a day that remains so critical uh, that parliamentarians play in shaping our societies upholding democratic values and representing the voice of the people. This occasion also serves as a timely reminder of the importance of engaging the young generation in the democratic process and renewing our commitment to democracy for every new generation. Democracy is not a static concept. It requires continuously evolution to remain vibrant and relevant and it is our responsibility to pass on the torch of democracy to future generations. Democracy cannot be taken for granted. In recent years, representative democracies has faced significant challenges and some come under pressure worldwide. Polarization, disinformation and declining trust in political institution threaten the very foundation of our democratic systems. Therefore, we must be engaged and proactive in safeguarding the principle of democracy that we hold so dearly. Renewing democracy requires us to adapt and to innovate. Just to give an example, by using new technology, new technology and digital tools, we can work the bridge to the gap between the young generation and their elected representatives, making governance more accessible and inclusive. We can create new platforms for meaningful participation and thereby giving more citizens, particularly the young generation, a stronger voice and easier access to the decision-making processes. Of course, of course, we do not have to agree on everything in our parliaments. That is the basic fact in a representative democracy. In my home country of Denmark, we have 12 different parties in the parliament, representatives from Greenland and from the Faroe Islands. I can tell you that gives a good condition for discussions. But at the end of the day, when a decision has been made, when a bill has been adopted, we all respect the outcome as a result of a democratic process. However, nobody is perfect, and therefore the International Day of Parliamentarism is a good opportunity for all of us parliamentarians to review the way we're working and achieving some key goals, but to be more representative and move with the times, working to include more women and more young MPs and adapting to new technologies. Dear fellow parliamentarians, Let's 
us not forget that the, that the democracy and the parliamentarism cannot be taken for granted. Let us stand up to defend our democracies. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Con esta intervención eh, terminaríamos esta mesa redonda. Creo que hay dos elementos muy importantes que han salido en prácticamente todas las intervenciones que se han producido para combatir eh, una de las mayores amenazas a la democracia, eh, como es el populismo. Por un lado, dignificar la política, y eso depende de nosotros, de cómo ejercemos la política. Tenemos que huir de la mentira, tenemos que huir de la ofensa y huir también del insulto. Y, en definitiva, lo que tenemos que hacer es apostar por el respeto y evitar, por tanto, la crispación, puesto que estos elementos alejan a la ciudadanía de la política. Y, en segundo lugar, creo que también es fundamental potenciar la política útil, la buena política, aquella política que lo que hace es desplegar políticas concretas que ofrecen soluciones reales a los ciudadanos. Es la mejor manera para que las instituciones la sientan cerca, la sientan útiles y, por tanto, que sigan participando de manera activa y se involucren en nuestra democracia. De otra manera, las democracias pueden languidecer y, por tanto, estar en peligro. Con esto terminaríamos esta mesa redonda y, si les parece bien, podemos eh, dar paso a continuación ya a las conclusiones y para, y para ello le, de, le daré la palabra al señor Jonathan Murphy para que eh, nos lea la declaración de León sobre parlamentarismo que nos acerque a las conclusiones precisamente de la jornada del día de hoy. Señor Murphy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, honor honorable speaker, honorable speakers, honorable deputies, members of parliament, honored guests. I'm pleased to read out the uh, provisional declaration of speakers uh, today. On the defense of European values and democratic institutions faced with the new challenges and threats to democracy. The speakers stress that we are at a crucial moment for the development and consolidation of democracy worldwide in the face of new challenges and threats. The speakers note with concern threats such as Russia's illegal war of aggression against Ukraine, the assault against parliamentary institutions, foreign interference in democratic and electoral processes, disinformation generated by social media that disrupts social debate and alters the democratic conversation, or challenges such as digitalization, artificial intelligence, the energy and food crisis, or the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Speakers consider that there are national factors that play a role in the way these common developments are addressed, which constitute real internal threats to democracy, such as the rise of extremism and populism, nationalism, protectionism, the deterioration of democracy, um, democratic quality in many countries, extreme polarization, and the emergence of authorita authoritarianism. And they recall, I think, okay, and they recall that totalitarianism also uses democracy and parliaments for its establishment and consolidation. The speakers consider that the rise of authoritarianism and the tolerance thereof are at the root of Russia's illegal war of aggression against Ukraine, which they, fir which they firmly condemn, since it is an attack, ag attack against the territorial integrity of a country which violates the Charter of the United Nations and hence uh, breaches the most basic principles of international law.
They support the continuation of financial, economic, humanitarian, and military assistance as long as it is needed until the full restoration and control of the internationally recognized borders, uh, the effective implementation of sanctions against Russia, and the establishment of a special tribunal to prosecute the crime of aggression against Ukraine, noting the indispensable role of ensuring accountability for the prospects of du durable peace. They additionally express hope for, hope for strengthening uh, endeavor of the European Union and its international partners to promote dialogue based on the key values and principles enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations and the Helsinki Final Act that would lead to the end of the Russian military aggression and all hostilities when the circumstances so permit. The speakers deem that the promotion of, dem of democratic values, human rights, and the rule of law in our, in our societies requires limiting, um, limiting trade relations with totalitarian regimes, and particularly the dependence on the supply of raw materials, basic foodstuffs, essential products, medicines, and technological products, and thus advocate for strategic autonomy as regards the production and, and diversification of supply chains and an increased cooper, uh, cooperation with other regions such as Ibero-America, Africa, and Indo-Pacific. The speakers understand that the assault against democratic institutions in several countries can be seen as a consequence of the current rise of populism and extremist movements uh, propelling, propelled by disinformation and false news. The speakers warn of the distortion of reality on the basis of, of which citizens have to take decisions in electoral processes using the tools provided by social media. And they welcome the adoption of the new Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act of the European Union. They recognize that, that the benefits of dig digitalization are obvious but its disproportionate and unbalanced use in, in the market to access such services may have a negative impact on democracy, uh, fundamental rights, and on the economy. They warn of the dangers, of, uh, the dangers for democracy of not agreeing on an international regulation of artificial intelligence and welcome in this regard the work towards a European Artificial Intelligence Act. The speakers welcome the progress made as regards the digital transformation of parliaments, but they consider that liberal democracies require an in-person parliament uh, with in-person spe uh, speeches and debates. And they consider that digital literacy programs aimed at the general population should be encouraged so that no one is excluded from the democratic process guaranteeing general access of the population to the internet. The speakers support extending to all parliaments initiatives such as the European Democracy Action Plan based on the Action Plan Against Disinformation to stop disinformation campaigns and for the, for the protection of the quality of information and of democratic systems and public debates. On the importance of parliaments to enhance democracy, the speakers declare that parliaments are one of the main institutional pillars of representative democracy and of the rule of law. As chambers directly elected by the people, they are at the heart of liberal democracy and must therefore be involved in all decision-making processes in the face of the contemporary drift from parliamentary democracy to governmental democracy. Parliaments reflect and guarantee social pluralism and above all the political pluralism that cements social support, support and the democratic legitimation of the state's uh, institutions.
The speakers support the strengthening of parliaments as a key element of the international strategy for the evolution of democracy. A robust and efficient parliament contributes to political stability, economic development, and to the quality of life of citizens. The speakers deem it necessary to improve the capacity of parliaments to address a whole series of global strategic challenges, focusing particularly on the political involvement of women and of young people. The speakers on, occasion of, on this occasion of the International Day of Parliamentarism on June the 30th uh, warn of the need to recall the origins of parliamentarism to be able to understand the profound social change this entailed for the organization of medieval societies. Um, they need to, under, to understand its relevance for, this, for the subsequent constitutional development of all modern democracies and be aware of why democracy is the best of all possible systems of organization as opposed to the simple recipes of authoritarianism. The speakers acknowledge the deep historical roots of the Cortes de Leon gathered in 1188 by the King Alfonso IX in this, very, in this very cloister of the Collegiate Church of San Isidoro de Leon, where this meeting is now being held. With a view to, to commemorating that, that encounter, where, where the institutional presence of citizens in higher level decision making, together with the King, the Church, and the nobility, occurred for the first time giving rise to modern parliaments. The speakers underlined the value of the Decreta of Leon, uh, declared uh, by UNESCO as memory of the world, being the oldest known written information regarding the European parliamentary system and constitutional heritage, based on the respect of laws established by uses and customs and procedural and judicial guarantees that must protect citizens and private property, thus laying the first foundations of the rule of law and equality, given its profound uh, resemblance to modern practices regarding parliamentary representation. On parliamentary cooperation and development of democracy, the speakers note that the parliaments of the European Union and many others are increasingly involved in parliamentary diplomacy and in providing technical support to strengthen parliaments worldwide, to strengthen parliaments worldwide, acknowledging that peer support is the most efficient way to share lessons learned and to transfer knowledge to developing parliaments, which in turn results in stronger democracy. The speakers recognize the progress made as regard the different parliamentary cooperation projects, such as inter Paris, Parliament for Partnership, for the effective development of democracy in the world, enabling a network of parliaments with a view to their technical cooperation. The speakers acknowledge the use, usefulness also of all other types of capacity building programs financed by the European Union or provided bilaterally by the parliaments of the European Union. The speakers support the initiative from the European Parliament as mentioned in the conclusions of the presidency of the Conference of Speakers of the European Union Parliaments held in Prague on the 24th and 25th of April 2023 aimed at drafting a charter of the role of parliamentarism in an effective democracy enshrining the fundamental principles and the key elements of modern parliamentarism const, uh, const, consubstantial to liberal democracy. The speakers pledge to continue working on this initiative with a view to the final adoption of this charter at the Conference of Speakers of Parliaments of the European Union to be held in Madrid on April the 21st to the 23rd, 2024. And a final note uh, that the principles uh, which were outlined in this speech, uh, which were outlined in the speech delivered 
in Lyon today uh, by Otmar Karas, first president of the European Parliament. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank honored guest. Mr. Murphy, eh, gracias por leer esta importante declaración de León sobre parlamentarismo que entre todos hemos aprobado. Quiero agradecer de nuevo a todos los presidentes y a todas las presidentas y representantes de los distintos parlamentos de la Unión Europea y de otros parlamentos del mundo las importantes participaciones en esta conferencia internacional y espero que una vez finalizada tengan ocasión para conocer y pasear por las bellas calles de esta ciudad de León. La dimensión parlamentaria de la presidencia española ha comenzado. Gracias a todos por contribuir a su éxito y gracias a todos y a todas, sobre todo y especialmente, por vuestro compromiso con la democracia, con esa voluntad de servicio público que todos compartimos y también por eh, compartir, apoyar y defender cada día los valores europeos que nos unen. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Sí, sí, sí.
Carlos, se lo doy, yo se lo doy. Ah, muy bien, muy bien, yo se lo doy.